One, two, one, two, check that, that's right. And then I'll just put this on when I need it. So right now, I don't need it, but it's...
Good morning, good morning to our friends in America. Good afternoon for our fellows in Europe, in Africa and Middle East. And good evening or good night to our colleague in Asia and Oceania. On behalf of, the, of Mr. Mohammed al Suwaidi, uh, Aspire Zone CEO, Mr. Ivan Bravo, Director General of Aspire Academy, Mr. Ali Saleh Matifa, President of Aspire Academy Global Summit, welcome. Welcome to this uh, seven Aspire Academy Global Summit that is here at the team Aspire Fellows Meet Other Sports. So we decided this year to open to live streaming. Therefore, with us, we have joined a lots of other people from five continents. Welcome to all of them. It's a pleasure to have all of you here. For those people that joined today for the first time, I would like to give a brief understanding of what is uh, Aspire in the World Fellows. It's a community of 50 between the best uh, clubs and federations and leagues in the world. We joined in 2014, and from that moment, we started to create a great, great connection. We did a lots of activity, and one of the main activities is the Aspire Academy Global Summit that we used to do one per year. But beside to this event, this key event where we try to, to share knowledge live, even if unfortunately for the last two years we are in a virtual, uh, during that moment we, we are doing many, many other activities. For example, exclusive interviews. We interview coaches, uh, top coaches uh, to have their inside. We have a um, uh, fellows training to enhance our uh, PVP. Uh, we do gathering here with a small group. And then we have a fellows research group. This group is, uh, is working on research. And thanks to you guys, to your 50 clubs and federation, and thanks to the survey that we share with you, we published, already published one article, important article on scientific uh, journal, and the other two are under review. So this is our uh, community, and in, during the last year, in 2021, we are doing a new program called Player Inside. And I think that this is really something that uh, is exciting because we decide to give the world to the player. They are the main actor, and we want to know from there. And we learn a lot in these first 16 episodes that we launching during this, uh, this year, because we learn uh, how they manage their training session, the strategy of recovery, uh, their movements from you to, to senior, what's the, the difficulties, the challenge that they found. And we know from them a lot of things, also from nutrition, how to manage internally the, the changing room, the leadership, all, all the relationship with the coaching staff. We believe, strongly believe that uh, to enhance the player performance, we should understand better the player. We should have the awareness, because only in this way we can strengthen our connection, our relationship. All in this way, we really understand what they need. Because at the end, they are the main actor, and all the things that we do are for them. Uh, this, uh, this plan, Aspire uh, Player Inside, as I said, is, uh, there is a lot of work behind of this project. Uh, Aspire Academy is with the, could work the performance science department, but with the, communication, marketing communication, uh, with IT, with a lots of uh, our department is putting a lots of effort. But really, really, I would like to say thank you to all the fellows, to you guys that help us to do this, uh, to perform uh, this interview. And I would like to say thank you to the, the six, first 16 team that provide players, that is Zenit, Inter Milan, Atletico Paranaense, Juventus, Real Madrid, Porto, Estudiantes La, La Plata, Basel, Man United, Atletico Madrid, and the five federations, Qatar Football Association, Italian Football Federation, but then also Brazilian Football Confederation, Argentina Football Association, and Honduras Football Federation. Really big thanks, because you allow to us to have exclusive interview of players such as uh, Lukaku, Bonucci, Lovren, uh, Pepe, uh, Marco Llorente, a lots and lots of uh, players that give the provider insight. 
all our fellows and all the people that join now can, uh, can uh, find this, uh, this uh, interview on the, our fellows uh, web. Uh, it's easy to look for the web because you just put Aspire Fellows and you will enter in a world of full content on performance, sport medicine, uh, coaching, uh, more than 300 inter interview, more than 300 presentation by, done by top experts, done by these 50 clubs and federation. And really, really, we are proud about, uh, uh, about that. Uh, please, they, they asked me to, uh, to all of you to mute your mic microphone, please mute. Okay, so now, uh, as I said, uh, you will find uh, this, uh, uh, this content on our web. And today I'm the pleasure also to announce then that uh, we did a, a face restyling, a face, face lifting of our uh, web. It's a new look and you will, uh, you will see, you will uh, entering in our, this web, something uh, different. At the end, during the closing, we will uh, talk about that. But now let's move to Aspire Fellows, Meet Other Sports. Why this thing? Why we decide to move in this direction? I have to say that uh, our community has been uh, forefront in terms of knowledge sharing these years. Uh, not only because we organize a summit, there are lots of uh, congresses, summit around, uh, around the world, but for the concept. We decide to work together for the entire year. It's not just a summit, it's working together, share the knowledge. So this is something different. Even how to manage the, the Fellows Academy uh, Global Summit with the round table, with workshop, this is another approach. But today we want to do a step forward. We want to cross the information, we want to cross over and bring the experts from other sports to give their insight, to understand why, what we can learn from them. Uh, in Aspire Academy, we are lucky, to be honest. Uh, we have uh, uh, athletes uh, we from football, but we have athletes also from other sports, and our guys can share, uh, can meet each other. And the same can the, the staff, the coaching staff can do, meeting athletics, uh, fencing, uh, and football together, and they learn in this environment. But we did a step forward as well. Uh, in the last uh, years, uh, Qatar Football Association and Aspire Academy signed an agreement, an MOU, with uh, the Italian Football Federation on this direction, how to share knowledge. And uh, we started, uh, even uh, thanks uh, to the uh, WEFA Assist project, we involved our Italian Olympic Committee with their knowledge, with their expertise, what they did. They provide their expertise on one specific topic that is uh, uh, players' football specific movements. So how to learn from the movements, uh, from the game, how we can improve the player movements. Because guys, it's clear that we have to reduce the injury in football. And the first starting point is to run in a better way. We do not care too much the run of our player, but it's a key aspect. Improving the te running technique, we have player quicker. We have more economy of their run during the, the, the game, and the most, we reduce the injury. And save their life, because after the career, after when they finish the career, they don't have so much problem. Now we face a lot of uh, ex-former players with problem on the knee, on the hips, because the problem was not taking in the right moments when they were young and also when they were playing. So this is the reason because uh, today, thanks to the fantastic speaker that we have, we will start to understand how to manage three aspects, how to manage the, the, the training, how to manage the competition, how to manage the athletes. And to do that, we put together, as I said, uh, from football, from the voice of football, we have the professor and the maestro. What else? Nothing better. So, of course, Mr. Asem Wenger and Mr. Andrea Pirlo, they don't need to, to have an introduction. But the other speakers coming from other sports, they don't need to. There, is, there are only a lots of gold medals that they won, and I think that there is nothing better than that gold medal that to explain 
how is their knowledge, their capacity to win, and from them we can learn a lot. Therefore, after the first two star chat, we'll move on the first round table on how to manage the training. We will have with us uh, two, two uh, of our, uh, of our uh, uh, speakers, Lorena Torres and Barry Purge. Lorena is expert in uh, um, basket, and uh, Barry is an expert in athletics. You see, we put together also a team sports and individual sports because it's completely different. So they will, uh, with Lorena, maybe we, we will talk about the challenges of NBA to, to, uh, during the congested periods, lots and lots of game. And this is one of the problems that we have with football, to be honest. But, and uh, then with Barry, we will, we'll think about, we'll, we'll ask him about the endurance because he was working with endurance, at least they won a lot of gold medal. Is endurance a, a, an important aspect also for football or not? How we can prepare to have a peak of performance of one team or one athlete in a specific moment because the athletic, they should arrive at the Olympic Games at the peak of performance. But let's imagine now during the World Cup, the teams wants to arrive at the peak of performance in one specific moment of the season. So lots of interesting aspects. And then we go to the competition that at the end is the most important. How to manage the competition. So we bring together two, two top athletes, Ashton Eaton and Louis Cola. Ashton is uh, a USA ad athletes, uh, decathlon, won two gold medal. And uh, Luis uh, is Argentina player, he won in Athens 2004, the gold medal, but he was playing in, in NBA. So what's the key? What, why we, we, they can give us some advice, key advice? During the game, what's happening in the mind of uh, uh, the athletes? The athletes, uh, uh, how, which are their emotions? How they, they manage the moments before, the moments after? how they deal with this pressure. All things that can, will give us uh, uh, some an, an insight and, and we will learn from them, I'm sure. The last round table, in the last round table, we have a guru of uh, volleyball, is uh, Coach Kar Kirali. Uh, Coach Kirali uh, won everything. He won uh, as athlete, he won as a uh, gold medal as athlete, and gold medal uh, also in the last Tokyo Olympic Games is uh, really a person that is very interesting uh, to learn from him. He can speak hours and giving uh, all the moments, uh, new content, new, new philosophy, new approach. So I it's the time to start, to leave the floor to the, our stars and uh, to start this, uh, this summit with the content. And for this reason, uh, I will call on the floor the first uh, uh, moderator, uh, that is uh, uh, Rodri Williams. Rodri, welcome. Well How are you, my friend? Fantastic. Oh, lovely lovely to see you. <laughs> and lovely to be back here. It was here in 2019. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, you're, you're right. talking about the, the, the uh, your website has had a facelift, but not you and I. Oh, it's the same oh. face uh, here. But, uh, <laughs> we try with the call. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, of course, in 2019, looking at the list, remember Samuel Eto, Tim Cahill, pleased to say that Tim uh, will be taking part, yeah, or is that yeah. a secret? But there we are, he's yeah, here, yeah, we're no, delighted no. that he's here. And do you know what, you talk about Aspire and about knowledge, and we have one of the legendary football coaches in the room with us here now, Bora Milatinovic. Well, yeah, and you know, know, he continues to be a student of the game. Mm -hmm. He still makes notes, he's still hungry, and he will still want to hear what our guests have to say. And so this is the secret, I think so. I yeah. think so, the secret is keep going, pushing, pushing, pushing. We ask to the athletes, we have to do the same. A few years, two years ago, less, much more people were here. Now, what do you think? We have to, to back to this number well, next as year. Well, as you know, I, I put down here, we're not, in, we're not in the same room this year, but we are proud and delighted to be able to introduce to you the most influential people, as Walter said, not just in football, but in other sports. Hence, uh, Aspire Fellows meet other sports. So, I let Walter take some time to relax. Uh, this is Aspire Fellows Meet Other Sports, wonderful. Uh, so to begin with this year, uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome a gentleman known as Le Professeur. <laughs>
podcast. I am talking about the one and only Arsene Wenger. Arsene, on behalf of Aspire Academy and Aspire Fellows from all over the world, we welcome you. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? We hear you loud and clear, Professor. It's uh, wonderful uh, to have your company. And first of all, as I said, there are thousands of people joining uh, this summit. And I'm sure that all the fellows, the Aspire fellows, all of them at some point already, as then, have drawn upon some of your philosophies as a coach or a manager. So if you had to choose maybe one or two of those beliefs or those thoughts that have given you so much, or those philosophies that have given you so much over the years, what would they well, be? Well, first of all, first of all, I would like to say I, I welcome very much the idea that uh, Aspire uh, meets other sports, because I think there's uh, uh, many, many points that are absolutely transferable from one sport to the other. And uh, I would say that uh, what we have all in common and uh, what is absolutely great in our jobs is that uh, we, we can influence people's lives in a positive way. And that's absolutely uh, fantastic. And uh, I would say that positive attitude towards human being is basically the ground work of a, of a football manager, of any manager of any sport. Let me pick right up off that about what we learn from other sports. I was going to leave it to later, but as you've mentioned it right at the top, did you, in your height as a manager and a coach, did you draw from other sports and see that positive <coughs> transfer into football? Yes, many, uh, many aspects of uh, team sports, you know, where the technical part is not so uh, difficult, uh, can influence uh, the way you practice. Uh, for example, uh, uh, there are many qualities in basketball where you play with your hands, you can play at a young age at a higher pace and develop uh, co collective connections uh, that are very interesting at an age where the player needs to develop uh, what uh, the opponent is doing, however, have I, how quickly can I understand the game. So this uh, basic question is at what age comes a specialization in, in sport? And uh, until what age can we use to play other sports to develop in our own sport? And it's interesting, with, with age, I'm jumping on to the opportunity you gave to so many young players. And that was something you believed throughout and continue to believe today. Of course. Uh, it comes back to the fact that you can... Uh, every player who is a star today was at some stage a young player who had a dream, you know. And uh, you have uh, that opportunity to give him a uh, star to develop the player. And I would say that uh, what is very, very interesting is uh, to detect what are the main qualities of the players. And that's why uh, uh, a manager is a guide, a coach, is an observer. And he tries to detect what, uh, how can I develop this player, what are his three strong points and uh, how can I help him uh, to develop. So overall, I must say that uh, at the start, the young players, they have not always the needed confidence. They do not always uh, know how good they are and that what they are good. And uh, that's why the observation qualities and uh, the, the capacity to develop uh, the positive qualities of a player is uh, very important for a coach. I remember you saying in one interview a few years ago, when you were picking, if you picked a, a young 20-year-old centre-back, for example, you'd know that that, sent, that young 20-year-old would maybe cost you some points in the league throughout the season. And maybe if you picked the 28-year-old more experienced centre-back, then maybe that would be a better decision for the points. So as a coach, as a manager, having to make that decision at the right time so you give the youngster the chance for the experience, but of course, we know the demands of, of football in particular, or any professional sport, the team need to win. But again, at the same time, you need to give the opportunity. You need to give the opportunity. I must say, first of all, if you want to give young players a chance, unless they are 
exceptional times. First of all, you need to be brave and uh, you need to be patient as well. And uh, in our sport, you know, you become a reliable player at the age of 23, 24. And uh, the teams who make uh, top level results are between 24 and 30. So, of course, if you uh, start with a centre back at 19, 20, you pay uh, to give him a chance with points. At the end of the season, you will drop two, three points in uh, games where you are under pressure and where the needed experience is not there. So another one of your interviews with young players, um, you said while you were making psychological profiles, the stamina in the motivation is more important than the intensity of the motivation. Of the motivation, yes. Would, I'm would you like to that. explain that a little bit, please? What, uh, you know, we made personality profiles of uh, the young players at the age of 15, 16, and uh, after that, uh, I followed all these players uh, for 10, 12 years to see where do they go from there, comparing to our tests. And uh, I found out that basically the stamina and the motivation was a determined, uh, a very decisive factor. Why? Because in, in jobs uh, like that, you have uh, disappointments are big and uh, the, the, the happiness is very big when it goes well for you. But there's no mid-ground and the players who can uh, recover from disappointments and to survive after disappointments and can uh, get up again and continue to be focused on the point where they want to go uh, are the players who in the, at the end of the day make it. And uh, the stamina and the motivation is basically a guy who wants it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday. After, of course, you have other points as well. You have a players who love football and you have a players inside all of us is a guy who loves uh, the sport he makes but as well is a guy who loves competition and the competition is uh, guys who love competition are the guys who improve always because they want to win they they love to compete with others and uh, they are not inhibited as well and uh, so it's important to detect uh, in every player what is dominant in him was that process of detection helped by meeting the parents or the guardians of those players because i know that you felt it was important well of course uh, yes because I, I would say when you want to develop a player you have to meet him to get out of you and uh, to try to know who he really is uh, the sociological environment of the player is uh, very very important and uh, for me to meet the family was uh, always very uh, important first of all to detect who is the influence on the player and uh, is this influence uh, uh, positive? Is the influence detrimental to his uh, progression? Uh, for example, a father who treats his son like God uh, when he has not played the game uh, will not help him very much to develop. You know. So when I knew, when I uh, uh, detected what our influences inside the family, I could have a speech to get slowly uh, having on my side and uh, adapt my speech to the speech he gets from his family. Uh, you, you've been hugely successful, of course, and continue to be so. And the players who played under you, and that large chunk, of course, was with Arsenal, uh, to hear what they have to say is deeply moving to anybody. And I think any coach would love to hear that. And Thierry Henry said, you know, you changed his life. You know, that, that's a huge statement, is it? So I wonder, you know, what's some of the key factors and the key influences in your journey as a player, as a man, as a human being, as a coach, those, that journey you've had, what, what's helped you to be able to be that influential, where you not only change somebody's footballing skills or football life, but their life? Well, thank you very much. I think, uh, yes, it's a huge compliment, but the guy who changed the most his life is Thierry Henry himself, because he's a remarkable human being and a remarkably talented uh, uh, player, of course. But uh, I would say we, are, we can help people, you know. We can help people who want to be successful. And uh, by finding, uh, first of all, the right positions, we forget that sometimes 
the players do not. Uh, that's why the, the eye of the coach and of the of the managers is uh, so important. Is that to put them in the right position that is adapted to their physiological qualities and to their technical and tactical qualities. But as well, uh, what I would like uh, just to highlight always by a permanent uh, communication based on three major things uh, that needs always the feedback of the players. Uh, do you, first of all, do you want to get better? Do you think you have reached your full potential? What are you ready to do to get better? And you can find the way to help people to get better. And I believe that uh, it looks obvious, but uh, not many sportsmen go as far as they could go. And that's where the coach has an influence, is to help them to develop and by a con constant uh, feedback and constant communication. And I would say as well, we as coaches, we overrate many times the efficiency of our communication. And we have to uh, work a lot on the quality of our communication. It's fascinating. And one of the things Thierry Henry said was how he, at the beginning, even though he was a very skillful and talented player, he used to blame other people. And, and, and a part of his growth was learning to look at himself and actually to blaming himself and asking himself questions. You know, that's quite a complex turnaround in a personality with somebody of that talent. Yes, but uh, I, I must say I agree completely with you and Thierry Henry analyzes Thierry Henry had a major quality, you know. He analyzes everything very quickly and very well. And, uh, but I must say, uh, in my whole uh, long, long career, I must say the common thing of all the top, top players and top, top people is uh, two things that are very interesting. Is they had uh, All of them have a very objective analysis of their performance. And they know why they missed something and uh, if they meet the same situation again they correct mm -hmm. and uh, the second thing is that they are relatively harsh with themselves and have a good mixture of intelligence and motivation mm -hmm. they analyze well what they do wrong but as well they are motivated enough uh, to change uh, to become better uh, it, it's uh, it's absolutely. I, I continue to say uh, it's fascinating, and maybe we, if we can just delve a little bit back into your personal history and your upbringing, and something you've mentioned is how your father never told you well done, but you could have done better. It's interesting. I went to a school that was our motto: uh, "It's not good if you could do better." And I just wonder how football and how coaching has evolved, whether that actually holds water today. You know, can you still say to a young athlete, no, not well done, you could have done better. It worked for you. I think it's worked for me to some extent, but in, would it work today? Well, uh, I agree with you that uh, the language and the speech has changed, but uh, the modern educator has to adapt it. and. Uh, uh, give responsibilities to young players to develop. But uh, I would say, yes, uh, I was educated in a tough environment where it was never good enough. And uh, when you had the strength to fight against it, you wanted to show that you have some qualities. Today, uh, so it was a bit more help yourself and you might have a chance in life. Today, uh, the, the speech in sport is more how can we support people? and. Uh, uh, the balance has gone the other way around. And I would say the, the modern challenge is to find a better balance again between support, what is needed for the young players, and as well uh, develop again individual initiative to help them to force to develop uh, individually. And uh, that speech today has to be rebalanced. And one of the modern challenges of the, all the young coaches who develop players is to forge the character. And uh, when I say, uh, because the society doesn't do it naturally anymore, and, uh, or less, and uh, uh, the quality, technical quality, the science has helped a lot to develop people, but I would say on the mental side, the challenge today is well to forge strong characters during the education, because after it's too late. That means reliability, accountability, uh, a helpful attitude in, uh, in the team sports, 
are absolutely major qualities that have to be developed at, at a young age. What you know today, out of everything that you have in your, in your, uh, not in your knowledge, what of that would you have liked to have had as some advice when you were younger? Well, I would say uh, I, I, I think I had one quality. I tried to be open-minded, what is an important quality when you're a coach and or manager in any sport. And I had, uh, as you said before, maybe from my education, I tried to get better. And I would say I was always open to science. And if you look at, uh, at all the major science that exists today, we were always at Arsenal, the, the earlier ones to incorporate and integrate science. Why science? Because, of course, I knew I was making important decisions. And as well, because science could help me to understand better the world I live in and uh, make more objective decisions. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I believe uh, uh, the modern coach, uh, when we started, uh, when I started at, this, uh, at a very young age, I had uh, to, to fight to get information the modern challenge is for the coaches is to use well the quantity of information they get and to select the three or four important data who can help him to make the right decision. So the problem has been reversed. Today you have to select before you had to chase. You mentioned science, nutrition, of course, and certainly when you arrived to the UK from Japan, it was, it was an instant uh, in fact, that you changed at Arsenal Football Club. I happen to know many of those players when you arrived very well, and they always tell the story that it was the shock of their lives. But even today, all those years on, that's still essential, and that nutrition is also still evolving. Whereas nutrition uh, was just part of uh, what you, I call the invisible training, you know, is uh, the the training has to be divided in visible, that means what you do on the football pitch, and invisible is after, outside the football pitch, how you prepare. And uh, so, of course, I tried uh, to bring that in, but I must say the players were intelligent enough to understand that it would help them to, do, to get better performances and last longer in the job. Let's not forget, if you look at the, how you, it shows you how science has helped uh, people, is that uh, the best goal scores today are uh, people are all over 32, and uh, the fight between uh, the three Ballon d'Ors uh, this season was Messi, a, born in 87, that means 34 years old, Benzema, born 87, 34 years old, Lewandowski, born 87, 34 years old. That means that shows you how much science has helped people to last longer uh, in top jobs. It's, it is incredible. Uh, and evolving is what you did. The game evolved. You evolved and help evolve it. How difficult was that for you at times? No, it was interesting. I would say that was the real change I liked. You know, uh, it is not... I tried always to be in front of other clubs because you compete with other clubs and other, uh, from all over the world. And... Uh, the anticipation and uh, even today what is interesting for me is to see where, where does the world go, where does our sport go, sport go and how can we anticipate the evolution of a game. So overall that is, a, uh, I didn't feel that uh, as a burden, I felt, I, I experienced that as an excitement and, uh, and uh, possibility for me as well to compensate the less financial resources we had to compete with uh, the guys who had more money than we had. As the game has evolved, one thing that I believe, is it fair to say, that has remained constant in the way you see football is you, what you want to and you like to see it played, is, if it's the right term, in its purest form. That's how yes. you did it with Arsenal. Arsenal you know, it was all about attacking football. Some journalists would write the only time you ever went out to nullify another team was the 2005 FA Cup final against Manchester United in Cardiff, which you won anyway, <laughs> because it became the first uh, Cup final well, to be won by a penalty shootout. But other than that, it's always been about the purest form. Yes, because I believe that, uh, you know, the, the individual human beings are guided by their ego and their ego. 
ego is uh, always about a little bit a limiting factor because it's of course it has positive things because you want to be do well you, you want to be the best but as well the ego control uh, stops you sometimes to go into something deeper than just me and uh, compare to others it is to develop something together and i always try to go what i call in the deeper me that means in the consciousness of uh, how can we together develop, dedicate it to develop something together? And uh, I felt as well that uh, the ego and uh, the fear were limiting factors. And I tried always to, to get that out of the system of, of the players, to go some, into something deeper that is just enjoyment. And when we had an uh, unbeatable uh, season, the players discovered that, you know. And I'm grateful for... Uh, in my life for having seen that, that they took charge of a project and they just developed it together. They owned the way to play and the results were only secondary. There was something deeper, something bigger. Uh, the heart did go for something much uh, deeper than that. And for having seen that, driving to a game on your coach and just thinking, let's just play today. The result will come uh, anyway. You said the meaning, getting into the deeper you, as you just touched on it there, the meaning of your life was football. And sometimes I'm afraid of that. Arsene, what are you afraid of? Uh, for, for being a little bit one-sided in my, my life and dedicated only to one aspect of life. And uh, you, you know, uh, we are, I'm, if to be happy... Uh, is to be happy, uh, is to be content with the life you had. I must say I'm very happy, you know, overall. But I look as well, I'm lucid enough to look at the negative sides of that, is that competition eats you slowly and uh, uh, becomes, uh, your life becomes one-dimensional. And uh, in the fact that you're only focused on uh, uh, results, how can I win the next game and... Uh, uh, you sacrifice many aspects. I say many times, you know, this is a job where you have to take your luggage from one day to the next and go to Asia, to South Africa. Uh, and uh, so it is a, a job for single people. Uh, I've just got to jump through a couple of questions now. Time is going on. I want to be with you all afternoon. Um, Chief of Global Development uh, at FIFA, that's what you are now. What are the, the strategies that are exciting you and that you're developing at the moment? What uh, is the most exciting I do is uh, the educational part because I feel uh, I, I was a young kid and in my village you had no chance to become a football player. I, my, my, uh, my way in life is a little miracle. But I would say today... No matter where you're born, you have not the same chance. And I would like uh, personally to develop that aspect, is that to give every talent the same chance in the world. And uh, that's why uh, uh, I've developed a few departments. One is the analytical side. Uh, we want to have the best analysis of the games, and uh, we want to show that in the Arab Cup. And uh, we have created a training center and we have created development scheme as well. We analyzed in 205 countries what is the strengths and the weaknesses of a country, and we want to go inside the country and help them to develop uh, uh, football. And uh, I have another influence, of course, is on the international match calendar, and uh, that has been a lot talked about. But I feel the biggest responsibility for me is to develop the educational aspect of football all over the world. And uh, less than a year away now, uh, Qatar, of course, will host the FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022. Uh, I know you have spent much time here. What are your expectations now? We're less than a year away. I would say uh, it's a very interesting World Cup in two aspects because it will be the most compact World Cup because it's the first time maybe uh, that during the entire World Cup we have a population on a very short space. So if that is uh, going well, it could be really fraternity uh, feast and uh, uh, it could be something absolutely fantastic and uh, it's the last time as well that you play only with 32 teams and uh, so uh, that is of course a reduced uh, 
number of clubs all over the world. You have 211 federations. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would say it will be very, very interesting. I've been many times in uh, Doha, and I know that Qatar has prepared very, very well. And I would say people would be surprised by the quality of this World Cup. I'm convinced of that. And finally, just a quick one. Uh, you stated, of course, you watch football most days. So very quickly, what have you watched in the every last... Day. What, every day. What have you watched in the last week? And do you like what you see? Yes, I like what I see. I, I uh, would say f football has become faster. Uh, the physiological qualities in the last 10 years, the, the pace, the power has uh, developed very well. What I watched uh, uh, last night was uh, Liverpool, Everton Liverpool. I watched as well Paris Saint-Germain uh, Nice last night. So I, I watched many games, you know, and uh, overall uh, every day tonight I will watch Arsenal, my loved, beloved club. And uh, so f to have football at night for me helps me to be motivated during the day. Wonderful. Arsene Wenger, thank you so much for your time and your insight. Uh, and uh, yes, on behalf of the Spire Fellows, we all say thank you thank very you. much indeed. Say hello to Bora as well. Bora Milutinovic, we will <laughs> pass on your best wishes. Arsene Wenger, thank you very much. Brilliant. Oh, wonderful. Uh, and, and I have to say again, I mentioned it at the start, that uh, Bora Milutinovic, a legendary manager who still likes to learn from the game, every single manager and head coach I've ever met always ask me how is Bora and where is Bora so they could have a chat whether it was David Moyes whether it was Roy Hodgson whether it was Santiago Solari or Hernan Crespo uh, incredible so uh, wonderful to hear from uh, Arsene Wenger and I think you'll uh, agree a, a complete uh, insight there into the mind of a great football man a professor of the game. Right, we uh, stay with me for a moment because uh, we go on to another huge name uh, in the world of football. Uh, this gentleman is considered one of the greatest players of all time. The vision, the ball control, the technique, the passing, and of course the deadly art of the free kick, the maestro. <laughs> We're just waiting uh, to connect to our next guest who will uh, share with us uh, his insight, well, into his whole life, his development as a young player, and of course, some of the things that Arsene Wenger mentioned there about longevity uh, in football today is certainly pertinent with our next guest who played until the ripe of age of 38 and uh, was a maestro right up until the very end. Uh, interesting to hear Arsene Wenger's thoughts there on player development, the psychological aspect, the physical aspect, and, and how they used to do the player profiling at, at, at a young age and how important it was to be able to single out those fantastic qualities uh, at such an early age. And it's interesting to see, of course, Thierry Henry, uh, one of the players that we talked about there as an assistant uh, manager there at Belgium. Now, and of course, Patrick Vieira, another one of uh, the great players under Arsene Wenger, who is in the English Premier League with uh, Crystal Palace. Uh, there was so much more we could have and wanted to discuss with uh, Arsene Wenger, but unfortunately, he's a busy man and uh, we have to move on. Uh, coming up uh, later on, as uh, Walter said, of course, uh, we'll also be uh, speaking to Karch Kirali. Uh, and now he is an incredible uh, coach of, of volleyball, uh, joining us from the United States. Uh, and he's... Uh, 
uh, he's been successful in a unique way in winning three Olympic gold medals as an athlete uh, with volleyball and uh, now, of course, uh, a successful coach. And uh, he's the current coach of the women's U.S. volleyball team and led them to a gold medal uh, recently in the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. So uh, he will be coming up in just a little while. So we are back to the maestro. So once again, let's welcome the one and only Andrea Pirlo. Andrea, how are you? Very nice to see you. Oh. Andrea will be speaking to us in Italian, and therefore uh, I will have a translation here, so I'll wait for that. I was introducing you there, uh, Andrea, as, uh, you know, a great playmaker over the years, and those qualities, you know, the vision, the ball control, the technique, the creativity, your passing, all those gave you the title of maestro. So, with that title in mind, did you find that a huge responsibility or a motivation? I'm on channel two. There's noise, but I'm not hearing. Sorry, Andrea, if you just, uh, if you just uh, stay with me for a second. I've got the right channel. I can hear noise, but I can't hear anybody talking. It's working. There's just... Ah, ah here we go. Is somebody talking? Ah, now I can hear you. Ah, ah, my, the, the, um, the translator cannot hear Andrea Pirlo. So this is the only issue we've just got at the moment. Fellows all over the world, whatever time of day it is there with you, and I know that many of you are in the middle of the day, many of you are just waking up, and many of you are going to sleep or should have gone to sleep. So you're staying with us and uh, we are very grateful for that and uh, we look forward to having your company over the next hour and a half or so. Tim Cahill is still here. He'll be uh, uh, in charge of one of the round tables as well. And as I said, uh, I'll be uh, uh, speaking a little later to um, another influential character in uh, Karch Kirali. Uh, the volleyball coach from the United States, uh, because that, of course, uh, is the subject of our discussion today. Aspire fellows meet other sports, and that transfer from one sport to the other, training techniques from one sport to the other, whether that be physical or whether that be mental. Uh, and again, Arsene Wenger touched on that and talked about many of the positive transfers from one sport to the other. And he was talking about basketball. It's interesting, actually, basketball is one of those games that uh, whether you play rugby, football, or many team sports, basketball is one of those games that are used often, well, years ago and today, uh, to help develop the training techniques. Uh, so those were Arsene Wenger's thoughts. Of course, Arsene Wenger, there's a, there's a movie out uh, at the moment uh, called Arsene Wenger Invincibles. If you get a chance to watch that, that is a fine piece of cinema. Great story, great access, and... Um, Arsene Wenger himself appearing in that film, of course, and, uh, and very honest indeed. I'm um, certainly looking forward to hearing from Andrea Pierlo. I hope we uh, are able to sort out this little technical issue. As I said, Andrea Pierlo, of course, uh, who played until the age of 38, finished his career out there ooh, in the United States. That was a little bit of a loud screech. There we go. Bear, ooh. Just bear with us. <laughs> I'm having a few smiles from the back there, Tim Cahill. I might just call him up any moment now. <laughs> We've got, we pull him off the bench. One of the great substitutions, mind, that would be, wouldn't it? You know, Andrea Perlo, 
can't get Andre at the moment. We have to get Tim Cahill on off the bench. What do you say, Tim? Tim's going to be uh, hosting uh, the second round table uh, in a little while. Do you want to pop up here, Tim? Oh, Bora? Ooh. Yeah, I was just saying, I look back, remember looking back at that uh, wonderful summit we had in 2019. And I need to go, okay. Good, yeah, after, good afternoon. Give, I, me, give me one ball. Give, give, one give ball. him a ball. Give him a stage. Need to play, yeah. How are you? Cue those applause over there, if you don't yeah, mind. Hey. How are you? you coming up? Come on. Oh, come on. There you go. Still an athlete. <laughs> Going to sit over there. And I tell you what, you say give me a ball. When I walk to go and have a sandwich for lunch, that's exactly where Bora was, down on the pitch with the ball. Normal, this is my life. It I, is I'm sorry, my English is not so good. Buongiorno, Italia. <laughs> <laughs> Buenas tardes. You're English, you speak Italian, you speak Spanish. Serbian. 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 You speak. Uh, do you want to have a seat? Put, put, okay. Have a seat. Thank you very much. Let, let's get your reaction to some of the things that uh, Arsene Wenger said there. Specifically, specifically about the development of, of a young player. Because he was, with Arsenal, that was one of the things that he was, became very well known for, was developing that young talent and giving that young talent opportunity. Normally, you need to give an opportunity to a young player, you know. First, I'm so happy to be here in Aspire. And you know how many years I'm here? I'm going to give it 15 years. No, 12. Oh. <laughs> no, no, but you know what I tell you? I, I'm a very happy for I'm lucky to work in Al-Sad, in Al 2004, 2005. We win the Cup. But you know how many young players we have in the team? The under 60, under 70? What do you think? Now I ask you. Right, so before, so as you arrived or after you arrived? No, when I arrived. How when? many players from under 70 play in the first team? Before, as you arrived, I'd say maybe one or two. But after? All. No, no. And I'd say, six, after, seven. I'd say, I'd say seven no, or eight. No, seven, seven. Very important, I think seven? very important to know mentality, the young player, what you need to do with them. I come from one. Beautiful school, the Partisan Belgrade. I was, I learned there to play football. After I do my training in relation, and I learned it is so important. But much more important, you need to show what they need to do. You know what is my problem? Something. What is it? I don't speak English. <laughs> so communication. Communication, but, for example, in U.S. national team, '94. No league, nothing, 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 but we have a very competitive team. My empathy with the players was great, and for this I am so happy. M much more important what you show them in the field, you know how much you speak. Yeah. So, but, so that, was, that was a hurdle that you had to cross to get the best out of the team without being able to necessarily make your point very clear through language. But how did you make your point clear then? But through what you showed them, through but very, very easy communication, communication, empathy, every training, how training need to be. Now I go to ask you one question, you know answer. Which action is more important in the game? The next one. Next one. <laughs> no, you learn very you see, well. This is what I've learned from Bora after, but after I don't 10 ask years you in Qatar. Other question, who decides when you go to move in the field? Who or what? The ball. The ball, of course. <laughs> you speak so much, but you need to know, that you need to have a relation, what you need to do when you have ball, when you don't have ball, how is the pressure, what encompassing so many things, but so easy for this step by step, you one day you come to be a great player. You know, you made a big name as an international manager, of course, and your huge success in FIFA World Cups, and therefore bringing an international team together and getting that to gel is very different from a club manager, Arsene Wenger talking about the, the psychological profiling and meeting of the parents. That's, you know, so they, you create the player within the club. Very different to international football. But it's the same. You, the game is the same, international or the team. The, the game is the same, but you need to know what you need to do to be competitive. I was so lucky to, you know how many games I have, international games? 312. <laughs> 
300, uh, 12 international with national team, but I, I think this is important. You learn, but the football is the play. You need to know what you need to do with the ball, without ball. After you need to show, so easy. So, so let me ask you what I asked Arsene Wenger there, what you have learnt and what you know today with all your knowledge and experience. What of that would you have liked to know when you were a young footballer just starting in the game? Today? Yeah, you know, so if you had all the knowledge you have, yes. but you would, you were, if you were back as a young boy, what of that, what information would you have liked? to have them. You know, to, to enjoy the game. They, they speak so much about depression. You think depression exists or not? What do you think? Now is my question. Depression exists or not? I think the pressure can exist. It depends how the individual and how the head coach or the manager or the well, For the player. Yeah, for how example, they deal with it. For example, tomorrow you play one very important game. You have pressure or not? What do you think? Of course. This is my, what? I think so. I think no. Well, th but that's your job. But, but for this, you don't need to think, uh, guess who I play, uh, but I need to, to repeat what I do in the training. All time, I need to do my best. Even I make my best, everything is easy. You need to have team spirit. You need to work in the training team spirit. How are you training? You training how you play, how you play, how you training. Very simple, but you need to know exactly what you need to do. So, as, as an international manager, that was your job to help the players forget about the pressure, to reinstall the enjoyment. Why need to do? You need to enjoy. You need to enjoy the game. Why? You need to do your best. After when you play the game, only you need to repeat what you do in the training, but this is the key. What you do in the training, how you do the training, after everything is easier. Do you think it's harder? This is a, do you think it's more difficult to always enjoy the game today? Do you think there are added pressures no today? Pressure. No pressure. For example, for our player today, I tell our player, I support Qatar normally, they need to do it. Full stadium, public, everything, grass, everything, everything in person. Now what I need to do? I need to repeat what I do in the training. I need to enjoy the game to do my best. I repeat, next action is more important. The game in 90 minutes is finished. See, it's very interesting because what you're, what you're doing is breaking it down and simplifying it, and I agree with you 100%. So, with all the developments in training, in science, in nutrition, is there too much emphasis on that, or is that still crucial? Only the ball. Only the ball enjoy it to play. This, I understand today you have so many things, but I'm old school. You know, I'm young with my heart, but old school. What is so more very important, you need to know what they need to do exactly. You have to, to perform better. Okay, let's, let's go into your past as a manager, as an international manager. There must have been a moment somewhere with one of the countries, USA, Costa Rica, Nigeria, whoever, where something didn't quite go right, or, so, or you maybe got tested, or you got frustrated. Impossible. <laughs> no, no, impossible. For this, I smile, but I smile. Impossible to be first. I need to be happy to have team. For example, in China, I have team. You know how many people in China they have? One billion, five hundred million. It's incredible, do. But, but what we need to do? We need to do our best, but we need to prepare to do our best. How you training? What you do? Everything. Many times I have big problem. I never play 11 against 11. You understand 11, 11, uh, 11 against 11? The way how we training, so many things, tennis, ballon, they do their life, you have to play the game, you, you need to repeat what you do. So, not one moment where you thought, this isn't going the right way. You yeah. never... You need to control emotion, you tell me, okay, we change the way, but what you need to do. Yeah, ah, so there were moments. Uh, no, this is the moment. Normally you have moments, but you don't speak about this immediately. You need to switch, you think positively, you 
need to see you will be there. Okay, then which was, the, which was the toughest challenge for you as a country to lead in the World Cup? Which of those countries? To be part of the team. When I'm part of the team, everything is easy. Okay. <laughs> no, no, but, I tell you what, trying to break Bora down but, is impossible. But, 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 no, but, but it's like this. No, no difficult moment. You need to control emotion. You need to know what you need to do. I don't... So which, which country took the longest for you to feel comfortable? To, to, not, this is not against the country, but for you to be comfortable with being able to deliver your job and get the best out of the team. No one country. No, not really. For example, I, uh, I was in Nigeria. Nigeria may be more difficult. They, they have a player all around the world, but you need to find a way what you need to do to, to have the good team. Good team in China, for example. I don't know one word the Chinese. I don't know the name of the player, but we play incredibly good. One, you use all what you need to psychological preparation. I tell you, for example, one field. Remember Titans? You watch it? Remember yes. Titans? With NC Washington, maybe you don't watch, but you need to watch this. I'm quite old. No, but you need to watch this. It's incredible. Yeah. Every, we do everything what they do. You have to do easy. I, I mean this as a compliment. You are still a student of the game because you tell me that. And, and you go and you watch football every day, like Arsene Wenger. You go to no, see... No, sorry. Arsene Wenger like me. Yeah. You know why? <laughs> he's, he's, he's younger. <laughs> of course. Respect, respect. <laughs> you know what? Arsene Wenger, for example, was a great coach in Monaco. Yes. When he, when he was coach in USA. He was coach in Monaco. Great. Great country. After I don't like to sp speak the Japan, to speak the Arsenal. Great but but what what do you look for now when you go you, you go and you, you you film your foot? I see you there in football matches. You're recording football matches. You you, you watch them back. You know this is the and it's an inc it's a great love and a passion for the game. What, what, what are you looking for now? You know you're here as a first organization the team. This right. is more important. How is organization the film? I never tape the ball. I tape how is around, around, but the ball is not important. But you need to know what you need to do. All, all immediately you see how is organization the team. But now, what you work more with the ball or without ball? Question for you. Huh? Well, <laughs> I think they're both equally important. No, they, the huh? ball is important, but but you need to. You need to have ball. You, yeah. For this, you need to recover ball. Yeah. This is, the, for example, the corner kick, free kick, everything. This action is uh, so important. Immediately, you see if the team work, if it don't work. Let me try and get into your, into your person, because you're very good at, at, at just keeping that distance, you know? And Arsene Wenger said there, hi, say hi to Bora for me. You know, he knows they all have a huge respect for you. Uh, me I too, me too, me too. But I, David Moyes, when he came here, first of all, he said to me, where's Bora and Roy Hodgson? And I was lucky to be with you that night, you know, the, the former England manager. And this huge respect, what do you feel you can still contribute to football? Do you feel that way, that you can still and want to? Normally, I, I, I like football, this is my life. This is, but many times they tell Bora, you, you're so old, but I, am, I don't think... I, I didn't old. say that. No, but, <laughs> but I, I know what you think. This is important. <laughs> but do you no, know no, what but, I think? No, no, but it's, no but I'm so happy. No, I enjoy the game and every day. I compete, I do my best. I think it's not important age. It's important how you feel, what you know, how is your passion. Mm -hmm. Do, do you like, I asked Arsene Wenger that as well, he watches football every day, you watch football every day. Do you like what you see now? The game has changed, the oh, game has evolved. Te television looks so nice, you know, you have the color, you have camera, you have everything. But the football, I don't like to speak. But the, I but prefer uh, uh, before, I prefer before you have much more uh, uh, player with, uh, with the talent. Today is different. Somebody tell me other day. Today is different than before. Before, you have, you have young player, the oldest coaches. Today you have youngest coaches, but oldest player. Now you you you, yeah. you know what I mean. Well, it, it was a very interesting point he made about the Ballon d'Or, uh, with with Messi winning it again for a record time, 
Um, but the, the other players who were also up for it were players who were all in their 34, 35 years of age. That, but that, it's only if you mention Ibra. Ibrahimovic, no. yeah. Well, do not go outside. Here, which player he make more attention for, for the Qatari football? Tabata. Tabata? How, how he old is? Rodrigo, Rodrigo Tabata is 40. He's 41 but in, every uh, day, this month, in November. But, but every day when he comes, he scores goals. What do you mean? Age is not important. Yeah. Much more important is how you feel, what you know, how you, how you are physically, psychically. I think... Uh, well, we saw, we saw that with Xavi now at Barcelona as, as, the, as the head coach there, of course. When he came here to play, he played into his late 30s and always gave 100%. The same as Raul when he well, was playing You here. have so many players around the world. The goalkeeper, goalkeeper, goalkeeper is around the world. Yeah, but it used to be goalkeepers, now it's players. Andrea Perlo played until he was 38. I don't know what the situation is with Andrea Perlo now, but... Uh, I'm in, I'm in great company <laughs> with, with, with Bora Milicinovic. Now then, the, the uh, FIFA Arab Cup is, is here at the moment, Bora. Um, and we're just less than a year away yes. from the FIFA World Cup, Qatar 2022. So how many times the World Cup? It's tomorrow. <laughs> no, you know my tomorrow. You remember when Qatar wins? Yes. Ten years ago. Yes, ten years but ago. No, it's already Eleven tomorrow. years ago, actually. No, okay, eleven, but... Precisely earlier. Yeah. World Cup is tomorrow. But, but you, I mean, you have seen that development. I've seen that development over 10 years. You've been here 15. So you've seen that whole development and the, the, the you know, the, the, the commitment and the investment to being able to put on this tournament. How, how do you feel? I mean, you support Qatar now. I know, I think, I'm no, not no, sure. No, no, no. I saw the piece about you. I wasn't sure whether you supported Qatar or Serbia when they played recently. No, no also, you forget Mexico. Yeah, <laughs> USA also. Yes, no, of but course. my team normally is Qatar. Yeah, I'm here. I don't like to put orders: uh, Qatar, Serbia, Mexico, USA, Nigeria. So only I'm sorry for China. Okay, let, 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 let's just uh, finish off with talking about Qatar because, as a young team, recent results were a bit tough as they played against the likes of Portugal, Republic of Ireland, Serbia in the UEFA World Cup qualifiers, which they didn't need to win, of course, but it was experience. But as a young side, they won, 2019, they won the Asian Cup, which was a tremendous uh, uh, victory for them. Uh, and they've done very well in other competitions, namely the um, gold, CONCACAF Gold Cup in America last summer, which yeah. I think I, I, they should have beaten USA, but they didn't. No, but also they, they play a very competitive team, a USA very competitive yeah. team. They have good coach, good, good managers, so many young player mentality. But for the Qatari team, what is important? To believe, to prepare good, and to be ready one day before. In the day, the game is important. Now, not so important. Yeah, so based on that, people and players and other countries around the world still don't know everything about Qatar as a national football team. Still, it's a bit of a mystery. Do you think there's a few surprises for some countries when they come and they play Qatar I, I, in the I, FIFA I World Cup? I hope Qatar got to have all played in good condition. Mentally, they already they show they have this capacity. Only what is important to wait, the World Cup, in the day, the game, I'm sure they got to be perfect. <laughs> no, normal. Yes. With a smile. With, with a smile. Well, Bora, uh, I'm going to say a th big thank you to you, as always. It's always a pleasure to be in your company and to see you today, to walk in and see you down on the pitch. Well, what I got to do... <laughs> yes, and, me, and, and the fellows around the world thank should you. be honoured that uh, you know somebody who took five different countries to uh, a FIFA World Cup and got everyone by one through the group stage. Only China didn't. But not important. But China never before, never after was in this World position. We, we made a great job. The best wishes for the Chinese people. If they go. If they like to go in the World Cup, you know what they need to do? What? Call Milou. <laughs> I am Milou. No, no. That's exactly the right answer. Listen, uh, Bora, take care. Look, there's, there's the stairs there. No I know you can, but there's the stairs there. Thank you very much. Don't, don't put yourself under pressure. Here we go. Bora Militant. That's a big hug. I'm, on behalf of the fellows around the world, I'm giving you a big hug. <laughs> Bora Militant again. Wonderful, wonderful.
Uh, right. Um, so what we'll do now, just keep everything moving, is to uh, welcome onto the stage Daniele Bonanno, who will moderate the first round table. Daniele. Hi. Nice to see you. We got there in the end. <laughs> okay. A little bit challenging, but so good. Thank you so much, Rodi. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here and to really introduce uh, uh, the topic of this uh, run, next uh, round table. It's going to be how we manage the training. And to do so, we have the pleasure to have here today for the Aspire Academy Global Summit 2021 two key figures on sport performance and physiology. So let me welcome on board Lorena Torres and Barry Fudge. So welcome Lorena, welcome Barry, hope you're well. Hi, thank you for having us. Hello. Hi Barry, can you hear me well? Hey. Very yeah, good. Thanks for Very good. Me. So let's uh, kick off uh, this round table. So when we talk about training and uh, is our, uh, our first topic, the challenging of the precision and the time constraint immediately spring to our mind uh, the difficulties. So, Lorena, in NBA, these kind of issues are, in the recent year, are uh, something that uh, we see a lot. So, which kind of strategy you embrace to cope with? Good question, because uh, just for the audience, I'm, I've been working in the NBA for the last seven years, so everything I'm going to explain comes from my knowledge and experience in the NBA and other team of sport, but I think we can extrapolate and relate a lot. So we have experience in having short precisions and the way that players, coaches and the league, probably the teams are facing it is the moment that you have such a short period of time to prepare players, you can use that period of time as preparation for the season. So what we try to educate players, and uh, it's now a norm, you have to work all year around and you have to use your off time, it, whatever it is, April till September or July, August, depending on when you finish the season, um, you have to take care of your body and your mind all year around and work by yourself or your team off season. Uh, I don't think it's happening anymore. You have a month off and then you get to day one in training camp and you start working. We, we don't have time for that. Um, so the approach is you keep working on yourself and you get to training camp almost ready to start. Thank you, Lorena. I think it's a very interesting uh, way that you explain how does it look like and uh, make us also think in a, different, in a different way. So endurance uh, is a, a determinant of performance uh, and the game is a man influencing the nature of this uh, physical capacity in football. So Barry, given your expertise, what is your consideration and also your philosophy? Hey, yeah, I know what everyone's thinking. <laughs> I've aged very well um, compared to my photograph. But look, hey, I think endurance running is very similar to other sports in the sense that, um, you know, you look at the physiological demands of that event and then you match training uh, towards that. Um, but I think one of the less glamorous things that people focus in on is just general aerobic capacity. Um, and general aerobic capacity is very important for recovery. Um, and that's recovery within sessions or within games if you're doing you know, you're running up and down the pitch um, between sessions or between games, but also across the season as well. It's, it's what fuels that recovery process and makes it more efficient. And just to give an example with, with somebody like Mo Farah, 
he would have spent 120 miles a week, week in, week out, building what we would call an engine. And, and when the crunch cup time comes and you go to the Olympics, um, you need to be able to recover very efficiently if you're doing a 10,000 meter race on a Friday, coming back and doing a 5,000 on the Wednesday and a 5,000 again on the Friday. So all within a seven day period. So I think uh, one of the less glamorous sides, but one of the most important sides is building that engine over a period of time. Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you, thank you, Barry. So back into the to the basketball with Lorena, uh, we see uh, that another challenge is a congestor congestor fixer, and the, I think the NBA player is a second to to known in terms of game played during the, the regular season. So how, from your point of view, the coach and staff adapt their program if they do so? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question, hot topic, uh, hot topic, always in the NBA, how to manage uh, the schedule and the players. Thing that we have, uh, or they, they play 82 games in a very short period of time from October till April, plus whatever the number of, of games you play in the playoffs. And obviously basketball is different than soccer. We, uh, basketball is a smaller field, it's indoor, uh, weather conditions are in, uh, more in control. Football is a bigger field, played on turf. So it's different sport, uh, different distance, high speed, max speed uh, numbers. However, it, it's, um, it's a very interesting how managing a schedule uh, works. So to your question, how you adapt to that? Well, you don't practice that much. Uh, actually, you have like two groups, so that's the way that I like to approach it. You have the group, the players that play X amount of minutes plus 25 minutes per game, let's say, and the players that play less than 25 minutes, and you approach them in a different way. But for those starters or main players, you barely practice because the game and the competition is giving you the stimulus that you need to uh, maintain your physicality or build up uh, during the season. Um, so you don't need physical stimulus to like during practice. I know it's not a very um, popular answer and probably coaches doesn't like the, this answer because they, I understand coaches, I think I'm pretty empathic and they need time for the tactics and the skill development and build things in the group. You can have that time with them, but with a lower physical load, or you can do shorter trainings, shorter practice uh, times with high intensity uh, to maintain those levels that you need. But um, it's, it's a very different approach. I think in Spain uh, and in Europe, I'm, I know more uh, basketball, obviously, and that happens to Euroleague. You, you go from one game a week, so you need practice days during the, the week to have the stimulus that you need for the competition. However, the moment that you start playing two, three or four games a week, you'd need different stimulus. Probably it's more around building tactics, cohesion, uh, team building and less yeah. about um, game and competition demands because you're going to have time to build that up. And depending on your position and the standings, if, if you are like middle bottom team maybe you need to be more prepared at the beginning yeah. to win those games at the beginning so you have less time to build up physicality but if you are in a, in the middle top um, ranking or standings you're gonna have time to use those games to build up so it's a completely different approach completely different paradigm and coaches sometimes struggle with that yeah. and i understand it's just that you have to understand how much competition and stimulus you have because of the congested schedule and work around that for practice, not the other way around. Did you notice any impact on the, on the injury side? The injuries, and I just have finished a study um, with injuries in the NBA. Um, it's not, I don't think injuries is only about training a stimulus. Is uh, managing the schedule. It's very, very complicated to have the top players on your team playing all the yeah. games 
all the minutes. Yeah. So what we have to do, people like me, is analyze the schedule, do the strategy, which games can you rest, or how are we gonna manage your minutes at some point? So you can play the more games, the better, um, without putting you in a risk situation. I don't like the prediction of injuries or just having some data to predict injuries, but obviously we have information. And with that information, we have trends. And it's more about managing players individually rather than are we training too much yeah. or are we training too, uh, too intense yeah. only. Now it's, it's, it's interesting and back to the, to the football, of course, uh, managing a, a different number of, uh, of players in terms of the roster is interesting how this can be, can be switched or, or thinking different in a different way. But thank you so much, uh, Norena, very, very, very clear, interesting, uh, as you say, it's an interesting topic. So, Barry, uh, you, we know that you conduct uh, really several interesting research on performance on Kenyan runners. And uh, which are the main uh, outcomes, no? the, the secret behind? And, uh, <laughs> do you think there is anything that you see applicable on football, in football environment? Yeah, of course, you can, you can learn from everywhere, I think. Um, you know, like with most things in, in life, it's not just one answer. The, the success of Kenyan runners um, is multifactorial. Um, and there's lots, lots of stuff going on there, but I tend to, I like to boil things down into three main headings. Um, the first one being talent. I think you've got to have supreme talent and of course Kenyan runners, um, there, there's quite a lot of talent there. Um, and endurance running, unfortunately, talent is king. In other sports, you might, you might move around the balance of, of, these, of these three things I'm about to talk about. So talent number one, the second one is environment. So the environment that you, you grow up in, the environment that you're coached in, the people around you, the things that you eat, uh, your approach to, to life generally has a big impact on, on how that talent comes through. Um, just linking it back to, to Mo Farah, he has an identical twin brother, which means he, he has the exact same uh, genetic template to be a world-class distance runner, but he grew up in a different part of the world from Mo. Um, not the same type of environment that's conducive for running and he's, he's as far away from a distance runner as you could you could probably get so a really good example of the interaction of the environment and, and talent in Kenya um, it might be altitude it could be running to school it could be diet um, it could be the coaching structure that they have there and I'm sure in football you can, you can all think of, of your own environments to nurture talent and the last one is, is mindset um, or as some people might might call it, hunger to be successful. It's the get up and go. It's the bit that allows you to uh, make the most of that environment, make the most of that talent. And I think the, the best the best athletes that I come across have those three things going for them. And I think if you if you use that lens um, to look at the environments that you're maybe working in now in football um, and look at the balance, what is the balance you're looking for? Is it talent? Is it environment? Is it mindset? Do you have any discrepancies in any of these these three areas that you might want to work on? And certainly in Kenya, the mindset of getting getting out of where they are, the hunger for success is is massive. Uh, and I'm I'm absolutely certain in football that these three things are are important as well. Yeah. Thank you, Barry. Really, as always, when you 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 bring this kind of topics, you you will uh, always reflect on your context. And imagine here in Qatar how much we are proud to, to work on, to find talents and, uh, and have uh, the right environment, the right mindset to be able to perform at high levels. And uh, this is another, another area to, to, to go deep inside. Uh, before to move on, just for the, our fans, fellows that are connected, if somebody want to address any question, please, there is a chat, you can write there and uh, one of the questions will be picked up from our staff and then we will bring over to Lorena and Barry as well. So, Lorena, let's back to the, our world NBA, and the, I think so there is some, in some part uh, some kind of anticipation on, on area that uh, maybe we will see in the in, in next future in, uh, in football, that, uh, as we know, the player training most of the time individually, as you were mentioned before, with their own staff sometimes, that are getting larger and larger, so, so personal trainer, physio, mental coach, so the question you as also director of some time of performance, 
are you managing to, to coordinate all this flow of information and make sure that the people that make the right decision on the player, they take uh, the, the useful one? Yeah, it's a really good question. Really another hot topic. Um, what is happening, um, I don't know if the audience is aware or not, is that some of the, like a lot of the superstars are surrounding themselves with their own stuff. Uh, probably because some of the teams, they don't have the most, the, the, the best stuff possible. That could be one of the reasons. And some of the teams, they have a really good stuff. However, um, you would have to have a lot of uh, physiotherapists, strength coaches, nutritionists to give that individualization that some players need. So they are surrounding themselves with, um, with a team. And that's okay if you work together uh, towards the success of, of the player and the care of the player. So I, I think a few years ago, there was a lot of re resistance. Oh, I'm the strength coach of the team. You should, like, you should listen to me and do what I say. But because the reality is not that way, you have to adapt. So when you are on a team, the way that, that I have approached it, because when I was in my last team in a leadership position, um, I thought, okay, we need to work with these people because we both sides, we care about the player. And you have to be more open-minded, establish, establish a good communication channels, share information, um, uh, because if you share information, they're going to trust you more and they're going to be more open to share information with you. Yeah. And try to work against fear and egos and competence and more in a collaborative way. Because honestly, I think this is the present, even, you're, if, even if you're saying is the future. I know I'm aware it's happening in football too, players working with their own stuff. Um, so we have to work. If I'm in the club side, I'm going to have to work with those people. And if I'm with the player, uh, I'm going to have to work with the club. Now, the way, in my opinion, and I'm finishing, um, this happens because also the players have trusted people. They work with these people because they trust them. I think if you are in the club side, you have to respect that, but also make a word the player. You can trust these people, but let's make sure that they are one of the best in the world for you. No, just because they are telling you what yeah. you want to hear. So sometimes it's tricky. Sometimes it's challenging. Um, but I think the smart approach from both sides is trying to work together and sharing in information, I think, is, is a key point. No, thank you, Lorena. You, when you were talking uh, you, back in 2014, when uh, Mr. Julio Velasco from Volleyball, there was one hour of our uh, star chat, he said that, uh, of course, you need to have people that have uh, trust and people that have a uh, high level to be uh, always on the, on the top. And uh, yes, from other side, uh, I, I will re repeat the word that always uh, Professor Valte speak with us, is to have an approach that is inclusive and to bring uh, all the people uh, together uh, create the right, uh, the right channel of communication, but also start you with the first step. So, move on. Uh, Barry, uh, we know very well that you are develop a lot of, in the area of innovation and uh, data management. So, and of course, is, uh, this aspect takes a lot of attention in the sport industry. So, can you tell more what is your experience and how do you change the practice? Yeah, sure. I mean, when I started my career in physiology, um, there was so much data, nobody knew, knew what to do with it. And I think now there's some amazing platforms, technologies out there that, that will bring that data together, uh, line it up in a way that makes sense and, and uh, you can actually work on weaknesses or strengths or whatever it is you want to work on with individual players. Um, I've, used, I've used big data, particularly around talent management um, identifying talent and then managing resources and so on that go into it. Um, so bringing lots of information together and making it work that way, which I guess for football or, or something is probably, um, you know, quite usual. But in, in athletics, that's that's quite a new and novel novel thing to do, um, to bring all that information together, because it's usually just down to how fast can you run around the track. There is any specific uh, benchmark KPI 
that you want to advise? Yeah, I mean, so w one of the nicest bits of technology I think um, that, that I've used quite a bit is heart rate variability on runners. Um, I think it's it gives a nice balance um, approach to just looking at general recovery. There are, of course, issues with how you interpret it, but with some expertise, you can you can keep a, a really good um, handle on how athletes are are doing. There's no replacement for the coach's eye, of course. Um, the coach tends to know who's tired and who isn't. Um, but I think across big squads, lots of people, heart rate variability allows you to, to have a, a quick snapshot um, of where people are at. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. So before uh, we were uh, uh, speaking about the congestion fix and having a lot of games uh, means uh, that we're not taking care about only the, the post-recovery or post-match. So it's just an overall approach, uh, an holistic approach where you pay attention to nutrition, sleep, the overall lifestyle. It becomes very, I would say, essential to make sure they have a longevity of the career of our athletes. So, uh, Lorena, which strategy did you adopt in, in your context? Exactly what you said, a uh, holistic approach. Um, I've been talking lately a lot and giving talks about recovery, and I always explain the same. People, when talks about recovery, is focused on strategies. Hydrotherapy, contrast, um, recovery boots, etc., etc., and so on. And the first thing is you have to know the stressors that you are dealing with, and most likely they are not only physiological, physiological, but also lifestyle and wellness. Once you know the context of that person, then you can start thinking about the strategies. And the strategies for recovery doesn't only apply after training and after competition on day or day minus one or day plus one. Uh, and then you go, you, you, know, you do the bicycle, you go to the pools with the team, blah, blah. That's just a very small part of the recovery process. Recovery process starts in the morning with a good breakfast to make ginger shot, and then you go and do practice and you take your supplements if you need them, and then you have a good lunch, and then you take a nap, and then you go to the physiotherapy, and then so uh, you do some meditation before going to sleep, and you make sure that your room environment is good, quiet with no dust, no light, etc. So. I can give an answer for which are the recovery strategies that you will recommend because it's a part of the analysis of the person, the stressors, the environment, and habits and routines. More than just giving you like, okay, uh, two, three, sexy strategies, hyper oxygen chamber and whatever else. Those are the plus. I think sleep, rest, are the base is on the base of a pyramid, the nutrition and supplements, if the person needs the supplements, and then everything else, massage, hydrotherapy, compression garments, um, whatever. But the basics are sleep, nutrition, and having a plan for the whole day. And then of course, uh, strategies post-game, post-practice, uh, etc. But I think if you really want to attack recovery, it's going to be more complex than that just few strategies based on tools um, or devices. I'm curious to know from, from my side, uh, Lorena, and, and probably also our, our guests uh, from, uh, from fellows and, and from all the other people that are connected, uh, the strategy did you, or the approach that you have also not only at, uh, I would say, at the club levels or, or team levels, but also within the player, within individually. So how to understand, to start from the awareness to have the tough part of that. What is your, your point of view on that? Yeah, super interesting because I have an infographic a slide that I made that I love. Uh, and it would be a parting shift. We are spending so much money in the clubs and in the teams to have the best recovery resources, the pools, um, the different devices, etc. But depending on the sport, and I think football, it's closer to basketball than from American football, for example, they come to the facility, they, they get ready, they practice, and maybe they have lunch there or they leave. So the approach that I, that I want to invite the, the uh, audience to think about is if they spend 30% of the time in the facility or with you, 
why we're spending 100% of the budget in the facility. Maybe we should have great resources in the facility, but facilitate resources when they are not with us. Um, so the approach would be, again, which are the stressors? What is causing you muscle damage, inflammation, decreasing your immune system, et cetera, that we can address here? But what can you do at home that is going to support that holistic approach? I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I think uh, reflection and critical thinking and how we do things sometimes would give us some interesting answers to approach and attack recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Lorena. Great. So before to move again to, to Barry, I ask if there is any other questions. So it's good. So mental resistance and human limits. Where are the boundaries, Barry? Um, I think the only boundaries are, are within people's own mind, to be honest, with, with most things. Um, I've seen people do some incredible, incredible things physically and, and mentally. Um, I think a really good example from running is the, is the sub four minute mile. You know, when everyone thought it wasn't possible and then one day somebody does it and the next day somebody does it again. You know, and, and I think that's in sport, that's one of the reasons why we love it. That's why we watch it is because um, you sometimes do break down the impossible. Um, the sub two hour marathon recently as well in running was an amazing um, thing to, to witness. So I think, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it's the people you have around you, the belief that you have, and the limits are normally just what you create yourself. Very good. So I have some question from, the, from our fellows, Ho from South Korea Federation, as to Barry. Uh, what do you think about the polarized training periodization for football? It can be easier to apply for endurance sport, but what about football? That's, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a football person, but I can see I can see where you're going with that. You, as I mentioned at the start, you do need to have that engine to work with. The engine is what allows you to do the high intensity stuff and recover quickly, and and be be fit across the year. Um, so yeah, I don't I, I don't see why people people couldn't do it, and I think possibly the the lower end stuff similar to, to the previous comments is could be done at home. It doesn't need to be done at the facility. It doesn't need to be a high, a high priority when, when people are on the, on the pitch, so to speak. Um, it, could, it could be something that's done out, outside of that as a requirement. But um, yeah, I think that training polarization makes sense for a lot of, lot of sports. Man, that's good. So I hope uh, our friend Ho from uh, South Korea Federation We'll be happy from, from your answer, Barry. So before we move to the end, uh, I would like to have a couple of questions, both for uh, Lorena and Barry. Is uh, from your perspective, as I say, let me pass the word uh, as a football outsider, even though that uh, you are a passionate of football, uh, in which area you see area of improvement? Who wants to start? What is the question? Where do we see? Where do you see looking fo football from outside? I would say, where do you see era of improvement? Can, Barry, can I go? Of course, go for it. I don't know what is happening worldwide, but at the highest level of performance, we still have a lot of injuries. So we need to think and rethink what is happening that we are doing okay. that we are not team or keeping the numbers uh, at a level or decreasing the rate of injuries. So that area, worldwide, high level, we, we need to, to really have a critical thinking of our processes and systems. Uh, we are not getting better at preventing injuries. That's the first one that comes to my mind. Betty. Yeah, so for me, I mean, I think, when I look at football or any team sport, I think one of the issues is obviously just individualization of training, diet, and so on across big squads. And I think, you know, what I see potentially happening in the future, and this isn't just for football, but it's for all, all sports and uh, health and wellness in the general population is an individualized approach to training prescription, exercise, diet, and so on that, that maybe has a genetic component to it 
Um, I think there are kits that you can buy now that, that look at genetics and so on, but I think it's still in its infancy. And I think, you know, over the next decade or so, I think we'll move far more towards individualization um, that, you know, I might be able to do with a runner that you might be able to do across a squad of players or, or so on um, in the future. So I think that's one, one really exciting area of research. I think everyone who's interested in performance should be keeping an eye on. That's great. So I'm, I'm going to have a last question for you. It's come again from our, our fellows, in this case, from our federation from Qatar. So you say, Lorena, a player needs uh, to arrive prepared for day one of the preseason. How do you monitor a player when they are away from the team? Yes, um, in the, what I, my experience in the NBA um, is that teams, teams have a, a squad, physiotherapists, uh, strength coaches, etc. And what you do is visit the players wherever they are very often. As I said, most of them, they have people in the off season, in the summer, in their countries, in the cities, then they go back. They don't stay, not all of them stay in the city where the team is. Um, so you have to go and visit them and stay on top of them. So a lot of communication with the people they are working with and a lot of visits um, to the place where, where they are working on. So I really hope that you enjoy as I do. And please help me to give a, a big thank to Lorena and Barry. Thank you. So now is the time to give the ball to my friend Tim Kail that is going to launch this second topic. Grazie mille. How are you? Very good. Firstly, thank you. It's been very insightful. It's great to hear the views. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're going to meet two amazing ex-athletes, both gold medalists um, in different fields. Uh, and we're going to talk about how to manage competition um, this is really important for athletes because the preparation, the mental, the physical, all the elements that go into to competition. So uh, we're going to have Ashton Eden, um, the Cathlon uh, athlete, and also Lewis Scholar, uh, NBA basketballer, uh, two very astute um, competitors in their fields that's going to share their knowledge about how to manage competition. So uh, without further ado, I'd love to welcome uh, these two gentlemen live. Ashton, Lewis, how are you today? Hello, doing good. How are you, gentlemen? Good? Yeah, thanks for having us. Pleasure, pleasure. I think we're going to be spoiled now, but I'm going to jump straight to it because, Ashton, you've been through it all. Gold medals galore. Um, there are two challenges in competition. For me, being an ex-athlete, I want to know the battle with you against yourself, the you against the opponent. Can you talk me through that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think this is something that's pretty beautiful about sport, um, which is that desire uh, to kind of over, overcome or improve uh, what you've done before. And, you know, from, from the battle with yourself perspective, uh, it's, it's really about questioning what, what is the limit of my body um, what are the limits of my capabilities? And trying to figure out, um, you know, how to answer that question or how to surpass them. And a large component of doing that is uh, the mental component. You know, we we were talking about, you know, how to manage a competition, but really, I think competition management comes from uh, the hours of training that you spend uh, to prepare for those competitions. I mean, 
you know, we, we spent probably five, maybe even 1% of our time actually competing. Um, track and field is quite a different sport. The Catholic is quite a different sport than basketball and we don't compete as much, but you know, the other 99% of the time we are training and that training is largely um, preparing your body, but preparing your mind to try to go to the next level out of competition. Um, now, the second part of that is just what you said, the, the opponent. So to me, um, the opponent is the carrot on the stick that helps you try to surpass yourself. Um, again, this is the decathlon. This is about uh, scoring points, uh, running faster, jumping higher, throwing further. And I think in order to do that, um, you need opponents to push you beyond what you think you can do. And so oftentimes we get in a situation in a competition where um, you really want to win and somebody has done, you know, something that's really outstanding and somehow, some way you find the will to push yourself to the next level uh, in order to, you know, try to maintain your winning position or get that winning position. So it really comes down to using the other opponents um, to push yourself beyond what you think you can do. Just to quickly follow on there, Ashton, um, can you tell us the strategies you use to perform at your best with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the main strategies I used is actually in training, I would put myself in every possible difficult situation um, that I thought I would face at a competition. For example, in decathlon, one of the events we do is long jump. In that long jump, we get three attempts at the event to uh, you know, give our best performance. Sometimes um, you, you get two fouls and you're in a position where you only have one chance to get a mark. And oftentimes because of that, you have that one chance, um, you make a lot of adjustments. So you're, you're in a safe position or behind the board and you really don't jump as far because uh, you're kind of taking a safe approach. I've been in that position in a competition and it's and it's and it sucks <laughs> because you know you ultimately don't produce your best result. And so what I would do at practice is I would say, okay, um, let me just act like I only have one attempt. How am I going to handle this? Let me act like I have a headwind uh, in the pole vault or a crosswind in the pole vault. How am I going to handle this? Let me act like one of my pole vault poles broke and now I have to use one that I don't normally use. How am I going to handle this? So to me, competition is actually uh, the best strategy that I found to prepare myself was um, try to be in a situation where I can feel comfortable managing any challenge, any mistake, um, any issue. And I found that when I go to competitions, I'm actually much more mentally calm because if some kind of situation arises, I feel like I've already um, have the skill set or the plan to, to handle it. Brilliant, brilliant. So Luis, thanks for being patient. Um, everyone knows the NBA and how big the game is. But let's break it down a bit. Just quickly, how many games do you play a week for an, as an NBA player? So, first of all, thank you for having me here. I'm very happy. It's, uh, it's a great stuff that we are releasing some of the conversations before. So, in the NBA, one of the particular things about it is like uh, the schedule is not fixed. It's not like, for example, in Europe or soccer that you play Sundays or you play once a week or you play on the weekends the National League and, and, and Wednesday or Thursday you play in the, in the European competitions. In the NBA, the schedule is kind of like a little bit all over the place. So there's some weeks that you want to play five games in one week, and there's some weeks that you want to play two. That's actually the two, the two edges. The, the minimal is two, the maximum is five. Um, and crazy as it sounds, the five, the five uh, games a week, they're not, they're not as hard this one thing called the four and five, so four games in five nights, those are the hardest uh, because usually it's in four different cities. You play one of them home and the three others are on, on the road. So you basically in four different cities in five days and you have to play in each one of them. So that's the hardest part. And wow. it's a big challenge also for players. So five games a week, traveling city to city, how many games a year? 82. How many? 82. Is 80, 82 season. games. Plus, wow. plus the players. Plus okay. The players that you get, like a team that play, that make it all the way to the end, and you will have um, four rounds of seven playoffs games. So it could be up until 20, 28 more games. So, uh, but regular season is 82, and, and everybody has to play games. So for, for the guests listening, 
82 games a year. So that means how do you look at your peak performance? How do you manage your body in competition to be at the elite? Do you well, taper down and then go up? Like, how does it work? Well, you know, now, now it's a big topic, big topic in the NBA. Uh, it's called load, load management. So some teams, um, you know, they get the, the, the superstars, the, their best players, and they choose and pick where are they going to play, which games are they going to seat, and how they're going to rest them, and how they're going to find a way to be fresh uh, by one of the most important games in the regular season and also in the playoffs. But when I was there, it was no, not not so much of these. Like teams will not do that, so it will be, you know, just trying to get the players to play every game. And it was hard. It was most likely like players trying to manage that on their own. Um, I think the system the NBA has now is a lot more elaborated. There's a lot of data science behind it. And also they figured out rotations from the, the physiological point of view. So how many minutes can a player play uh, before his production start diminishing? Uh, how many minutes does he have to rest before he can come back? And how many times can this player repeat this throughout one game and then through a week and then through a whole season? So it's much more elaborated right now. Usually when you see uh, the rotation of teams in the NBA today, which is different or a little different than when I was there, uh, you see players playing seven minutes at a time at once as a pretty much sort more or less the maximum. And then they usually rest for like about five or five to seven, eight minutes, but uh, clock minutes. So usually they also use the timeouts and the breaks on the game. So they, their best players can maximize the amount of time they are on the court. But usually you see players playing uh, seven minutes at a time and they get in four to five repetitions of that during one game. So we've spoken about the physical preparation. Um, first Ashton, I'm gonna put this question to both of you, but Ashton, Tell me about the mental prep preparation for competition. When does it start? <laughs> I mean, in my opinion, the, the mental preparation um, is really happening every day. Uh, again, like I said before, the, the whole point of training is, is to practice what you're going to, to do ultimately at the competition. Um, but, you know, practically speaking, to me, I always kind of try to uh, what we call it, you know, sometimes called get in the zone, uh, but just really focus on what I was going to do at the competition um, as I started traveling there. And that was sometimes, uh, you know, a week or two before if it was a big competition like the Olympic Games. If it was a smaller competition, um, perhaps uh, a couple of days. And really what that looked like is uh, creating a plan. And for the decathlon specifically, there are quite a bit of logistics involved. You have um, things that you need at this competition. Uh, whether it's javelins, shot puts, um, pull up holes, your implements, um, just making sure those things are going to be in the right place at the right time. Um, the second is, you know, when you're competing over two days, uh, do you have all the resources you need, whether it's food, support staff, like your physiotherapist, um, your, your transportation to and from the venue. So these kinds of things, even though they, you know, it takes your team to, to organize and help you out, um, you still have to plan for them because again, if something does go wrong, I, we've typically found that's where at the very highest levels, um, the, you know, the mistakes are made and the points are lost and, and the medals are lost. Um, and so just making sure that's dialed in and, and you have a plan for that. And then from a performance standpoint, um, I, I remember uh, my first Olympic games in London, you know, I was 24 years old and I was extremely nervous and uh, I, I think at that point, I didn't necessarily know what mental preparation was, um, but I remember sitting in my, in, at the Olympic Village the night before, um, just really nervous, kind of really, uh, you know, I, I guess you could call it scared, if you will. I was thinking, what happens if uh, something goes wrong? What, what happens if this is my last chance to get a gold medal and I get hurt in my career or something? And so, you know, you started playing games with your, your mind started playing games with yourself. Um, and, you know, from that experience, I learned that you can really only focus on controlling the controllables. Um, these are your reaction to events uh, at the competition venue and beforehand, 
These are, you know, how, how you control your emotions when another opponent does something unexpected. Um, and so I, I think, you know, the philosophical answer is all the time, but the practical answer is, is um, you know, a week or uh, a few days before the competition, depending. Um, that said, you know, it's different for every single athlete. And this is kind of the art of coaching, the art of being an athlete. Uh, I know some cultures and some athletes are quite different. You know, they will mentally prepare, um, they have like mental preparation exercises, if you will. Uh, so it's, it's almost an individual thing as well. And Luis, the mental preparation, like how big is that for you? How do you compete with that? Well, you know, uh, for, for a basketball player, uh, which is my case, it's, it's very hard to start the preparation at one particular point. You kind of like play all the time um, during the season, but also in the summer, playing for the national team. So um, I think the most valuable thing from, from a basketball player perspective is uh, how to be ready all the time. And when I, when I got, as I, was, as I was growing up as a, as a player, um, my thing was like, okay, uh, how do I get to the next level, right? So I'm in this league, how, how do I get to be started? And then when I, when I arrived there, how do I get to be, you know, the best player of the team? Or how do I be the best player of the league? How do I move to the next league? How do I go to Europe, the Euro League? And I was achieving those goals. And then eventually I got to the, to the you know, the highest level, which is the NBA. And I quickly realized that, okay, uh, there's, there's some things that I won't be able to do. The level is too high. These players that are unreachable for me. These goals that are unreachable to me. So how am I going to survive here? What what what, I, what would I be able to do that other players won't be able to do? What makes what, what is going to set me apart from the rest of the players for a coach to play me or for a GM to pick me and give me a contract? And I identified that this consistency, this being ready every day. Um, was something that it was difficult to do, that not all the players were able to do. Uh, everybody is able to play a good game. Everybody is able to have a good month. Everybody is able to have a good year when you arrive to play like the NBA. Everybody's talented. So eventually everything aligns and you have this great game or this great month or this great season. But I quickly identify that the guys that do that consistently, game after game, season after season, year after year, there were not that many. And it was because it was hard to do. And I find there that uh, there was an opportunity. There was an opportunity for me to uh, be that person, to try to be that person, to aim to be that person. And that could be something that separated me from the rest. That could be the value that I can provide to a coach or a GM uh, in order for, for them to pick me. And the first quickly after that, I realized why people was not doing it. It's not fun, it's not comfortable. You know, it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of discipline, it takes a lot of not doing a whole bunch of things that are fun. Um, and, and I talked to myself at that time and I figured, you know, you had to find a way to feel comfortable in this uncomfortable. You know, it's not going to be fun, it's not going to be pretty, it's not going to be easy. So if you don't like it, it's going to be a problem. Uh, and at the end of the day, I think for basketball players, um, and I believe this could be very similar to many sports games, the people who feels uncomfortable, uh, who feel, I'm sorry, who feels comfortable in this uncomfort zone, those are the ones to get to the best places. I love it consistency, um, controlling the controllables. Um, it's impressive. Ashton, how do you manage emotions? Because that's really important in sport. How do you manage those emotions when you compete? <laughs> um, honestly, I think when, when things are going really well, um, I, I don't try to manage emotions <laughs> necessarily. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, I, I love this contrast because uh, I'm learning from Luis, you know, Obviously, basketball and, and track and field are, are quite different. Um, and, you know, when, when Luis is talking about being ready every day, I was thinking, man, that must, that's, that's just a totally different mental approach. Uh, you know, for me personally, in track and field, it's kind of like you have the exact date and time four years from now where you need to be your absolute best. 
And, um, you know, just preparing for that moment is, is interesting. And then once you get there and you do have success, I feel like, you know, your four years or however long it's taken you to get there, um, of, of preparation and work kind of come out. I remember in Rio, um, every good attempt that I had, I was like screaming at the top of my lungs. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, you know, th those kind of energies, I think, inspire uh, me, inspire the fans, um, and inspire my next performances. So I, when things are going good, it's like, you know, you celebrate it. Um, and then you kind of get back to work, of course. The, the problem in track and field is when things are going bad. Um, I remember in 2011, it was before the Olympic Games in 2012, London was one of my, one of my very first major competitions at the World Championships. And uh, I was having horrible performances. And one after the other, you know, decathlons, 10 events. And I think I had like eight terrible ones. And I just kept going down this really bad mental wormhole. It'd be a bad performance. And I would get down on myself, It'd be a bad performance. And I'd get down on myself thinking I cannot recover from this. And um, what's interesting is I actually ended up getting silver in that competition. And what I learned was you, it's actually not as bad as it seems. Like you make it way worse. And so to, to try to learn to refocus um, to try to learn to come back after something challenging um, is one of those tools that, in my opinion, is only done by going through that situation. Uh, you can read about it in a textbook. You can have somebody tell you, hey, when you have a, a negative performance or when you're sucking and feeling terrible and you're down on yourself and you're just not quite on par, um, you have to do these things to get back to it. But I don't think you can actually do that without going through those things over again. And a lot of that stuff happens at, at training. A lot of that stuff, um, maybe be interested to hear from Luis, happens over several games. Um, and one thing that's interesting that I'll say is oftentimes people, you know, talk about peak performance and how do people maintain a high level so long. What's, what's fascinating is um, the definition of a peak is that there's a slope on both sides, right? Like that nobody's graph is totally linear going up or it's not a peak and to to have that slope on the other side i think is a couple things either a mental problem or a physical problem like you get injured or you get burnt out or what have you i think the, the key is it's like kind of like the stock market your graph will go up and down but to keep that average linear positive and what that down part is if it's not an injury to me it's rest it's, uh, it's, you know, taking that time off to refocus, um, taking that time to, when you are faced with a challenge, learn and make that second uh, kind of peak go at the right time. Um, so kind, kind of a long-winded an uh, answer to the question. I know it's good because we talk about mental, we talk about physical, we've just touched on emotions, but Luis, now we're going to intertwine pressure. Like I pretty much can already predict your answer because of the levels that you've played at, but let's intertwine pressure into competition and managing competition. Well, I believe like, um, you know, it's very similar reasoning uh, in the sense of uh, your question before. Uh, pressure is uh, something that brings you uncomfortable. You know, people want you to perform a certain way and you're not always able to do that. And you're not gonna be feel comfortable. You know, people will be criticizing you. But then, yet, at one time, I, I, I read an interview from LeBron, and he's like, you know, um, I play bad, and they speak, they, they criticize me. And I like that, because they mean that uh, they are expecting a lot from me. So you are fighting so hard your whole life to reach these levels. And when you arrive to these levels, the microscope where people is looking at gets bigger and bigger. So they, 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 they got more resolution, they get to see everything, you know, because you are on the stage, the lights are on you. And uh, they will see things that when you are on the shade, they're not able to. But that's where you want to be. So you have to be able to deal with that. And that's a little bit of what we talked before. You got to be able to enjoy that because you arrive to the point where you wanted to be in the first place. And it would be uncomfortable, it would be hard, it would be difficult, because if it would not be any of those things, nobody would chase this. Mm. So being comfortable in this uncomfortable situation is huge. And uh, at the same time, how do you deal with those? Like you need to kind of like learn how to feel comfortable, but also learn how to detach the outside things uh, from your actual performance. You are going to work very, very hard you are going to be ready. You are going to do all these things that you had to do 
the way to play at the maximum level. Like, like you know, Arsenal was saying before, like sometimes you're going to be in the peak, sometimes you're going to be in the valley, but that's going to be part of the process. The line in the middle, the average line that is drawn after it's all said and done is what's going to define you. And you're going to be able to accept those peaks in Bali as long as you are mentally, physically prepared uh, for that particular task. In, in, in the NBA, a lot of teams, they have what, what is called the so what mentality in the sense of like, uh, you had a good game, so what? You know, you scored 30, so what? You lose by 40 and you play very, very bad, so what? They, they waived you from a team, they didn't give you the contract that you were expecting for. You had to take a pay, a pay cut, so what? You got a max deal, you became a millionaire, so what? There's always a game tomorrow that you have to play. There's always a championship next month that you have to do. And whatever you did before is not very important after you did it. You know, what are you going to do for me tomorrow is what we all care. And this so what mentality helps you detaching the actual result to the process. The process is what it matters. The process is process and consistency is what defines this line in the middle, this other line in the middle that draws uh, hopefully, uh, and you know, like a positive line that will define your career. Um, obviously, it's a big challenge for athletes, but this is okay because we are trying to do big things. So you can't expect it to be easy. You can't expect it to be a small challenge. It has to be something difficult and it has to be something complicated. Love that. So what? Love that aspect of thinking of the way like that. Yeah, that's uh, Ashton, same. in a team sport, you share responsibilities, right? You're alone. It's just you. Um, how do you feel with this responsibility? You know, I'm used to team sports. Luis is as well, but is it lonely? Tell us about it. You know, sometimes I think the, that you, um, my, my, my short answer is, is no, I was not lonely. And the, the question is, why is that? Is it because of the way I am or is it because I was molded by my sport and, um, I, I competed in it for so many years that that is that, that is just what I've grown to to like or be comfortable with. Um, yeah, I, I loved track and field because of its sole reliance on my body only and its complete measurability um, and kind of objectiveness, if you will. Because as long as we believe that the timing systems are true and the heights uh, and the weights of the stuff things are true. Um, then, then the results, you know, can kind of speak for themselves. And I was always pushed by um, trying to get that one hundredth of a second uh, faster or um, one centimeter further or higher. And uh, I was, I was extremely. In, in fact, now that I'm, I'm retired, um, I, I, I will say that that might actually be the most comfortable <laughs> I've ever been in my life. And, and maybe it's, um, I think, a large part of it is because I'm a you're in control. And I don't know if I'm like a control freak or if this is a, a, uh, a, you know, something with athletes, but I just, I knew that environment. I can, could control every aspect of it. And uh, it helped that I was good at it. And so it was, it was an awesome place to be as far as I was concerned. Love that. Luis, so we've got football people on here and we're crossing over with sports. But give something from basketball that football doesn't have. Give us something we don't know or what we could use. I, 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 don't, I really don't think there's something that basketball has that they don't have. I think like um, I, I learn a lot from other sports uh, and, I, and I love that. And I always find something for any sports that will help me in my sports. I just don't believe there's something that we know that they don't know. But I do believe that sometimes in environments you create this truths that are they're actually not truths. It's something that people have been saying for years and it's just assumed that this is the way it is. You know, we, we have done it always like this and this is how it is. And then you go to another sport and they do totally different, you know, like the opposite. And it's like, what are you doing? Like, no, you like, this is wrong. But then you think like, why, why, why is it, why is it wrong? Why are we, why, why, why are we always doing it like this? And it kind of makes you think sometimes the answer that you come uh, with is, you know, no, we, we were actually right. It's better how we do it. But it makes you think. It makes you question. 
And a lot of times we create these environments, these micro wars that we don't question things because we assume they're right just because we've been doing it for a long time. So I don't think uh, we have a secret the soccer don't have, but I do think that the experience, the crossover sports will be uh, very, very, very good for either, you know, for a basketball player to go to a soccer team, for a soccer team to go to a basketball player or any sports. As I was listening to Ashton, I was learning. It, it was it was unbelievable. I was putting myself in that situation. I was trying to figure out how would I react. Like the fact that he would think he was explaining about the two fails and the third one. Like that's a unique situation for his sport, but we are in that kind of situation all the time, like this is the last second and we gotta shoot a free throw. Um, and the way he prepares, is, he has a lot of carry on to our sports. We can get a lot of things because they are specialists in that particular situation. And you can find those crossovers all over the sports world. And I think it's, it's so my, my, my thing to that question would be, we had to continuously pursue uh, this experience that make us think out of the box that make us question the things we've been doing in our micro world because the world is a lot bigger and the, and the body is just one. Yeah. I'm taller, he's faster, but you know, the body it has the same genetics. So there's a lot of similarities when we're talking about sports that at the end of the day, it's just body performance. Okay, so 20 seconds each. I'm gonna ask a question off topic. What is success for you two? Is it winning gold medals or is it the failures of learning from them, really quickly, 20 seconds each, because we could be here all day with how insightful this is. To me, success is, you know, uh, being able to prepare yourself to the point that you reach your absolute peak, that you reach your absolute ceiling. You became the best possible version of yourself. Um, and then eventually you arrive to the competition and you empty yourself. You leave it all there on the court. This is all that I accumulated during the process, during the preparation process. I accumulate, I put things on my backpack. I fill it with all these things that were gonna help me, help me perform on, on the competition. And when the competition arrives, I will use them all and I will empty myself. And that, if you arrive at that position, if you arrive at that point after the competition is over, I have won because I reached my absolute peak. Great, Ashton, close the show. Exactly the same, actually. Yeah, actually, this exactly the same. Uh, to me, s success would be um, com completely realizing your genetic capability, uh, basically, yeah. And I think the, the, the success from a societal standpoint would be when one generation reaches one level how can the next generation uh, go to the next level? And, and hopefully through knowledge and practice and training and uh, other things, we, we pass on enough so that, you know, the capabilities of, of the next generation are better than, uh, better than the former. Gentlemen, I want to say thank you. Control the controllables, consistency, leave everything on the pitch or court or track. I um, want to say a massive thank you because it's early hours of the morning where you are. Enjoy your breakfast, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Are you going? I was going to ask you a question. <laughs> I'll, I'll sit for a minute. Yeah, go on. Do you want to sit? I'll sit there then. I'll sit back here. Okay. No, it's great to see you. And it, it, that, was, that was interesting. It's, it's always interesting listening to an athlete who's only just finished chatting with... with other athletes and you asking uh, about success and the crossover of sport I found find interesting. Did, what did you did you ever do something when you know you're, you're peak in football? Were there other training things you picked up from other sports and thought, "Oh, that like I like that," yeah, and incorporated sure. it into your training and your game? For sure, it's it's funny because I've got a list of questions here that um, I was supposed to read. <laughs> <laughs> I pretty much um, try to intertwine my experience as well as an athlete and understand, but these guys are obsessed for perfection. They're obsessed to um, strive to be the best they can be and they're holistic in their approach. 
So when you see the common factors, that's why I wanted to ask, is it about winning? What's the metric for your success? So when you talk about sport, I grew up in a Samoan background family, my mum, so it's rugby league. I use the culture of the why, the respect, the religion, and then I've taken that with me everywhere that I've gone. So when you have an athlete of Ash and Eden's quality, and then Louise, who's like, so what? Then you get it, because the highs and lows, they're all the same. So that's interesting. So you took, you drew upon the spirituality yeah. of, of a different culture, of a diff, totally different sport, and that yeah. stayed with you the whole time. It stayed with me now because the work ethic, I've been retired three years. So if I put, when I was 16, went to England, if I put that amount of hours into training and to moving to England, America, India, China, and playing in all these big competitions, and you stop and you think, I'm just going to stop, why? Why would you not continue when you know the work ethic of your parents? Uh, my mum had three or four jobs. So we started with nothing. So it's okay to end up with nothing because you've still got your family. So the culture side of that, which is why you need to understand how to manage competition and all these elements we talk about um, with performance and recovery and here being with Aspire Academy, we get to implement this with real specificness to the, to the kids and we get to share information with the people on the call now and broaden our horizons with knowledge. So I thought that was really interesting for me to be a moderator because then what happens is I basically can put the questions into what I hope the listeners want to know. Yeah, no, for sure. And of course you're just out of it. Yeah. So really, I know you're saying you're a former athlete. It's, it's barely former, isn't it? So you're just on the edge there. So you're still living that, and I'm sure there are days you're still living that competition in your mind. It's now being transferred into a different way of life, a different job. Definitely, it's transferred, and I think it's time to wrap it up because we're going to be here all day. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm getting rid of you. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was, it, no, it was. <laughs> I was getting onto the subject of, of born winners. Go on, born winner. There right he is, it's Tim Cahill. Great to see Thank you. Thank you. Beautifully moderating as well. I didn't want to let the chance slip that I could have just a little word with you there. Uh, talking of uh, born winners, well, goodness me, it's, it's a great pleasure uh, for us now uh, to welcome, we're back stateside, um, the current head coach of the United States Women's National Volleyball Team, who's just led them to their first ever gold medal at the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, held earlier this year, of course, because of COVID, and thereby completing the triple crown of coaching an Olympic gold medal winning team, as well as personally winning gold medals in both indoor and beach volleyball. Some achievement indeed. The born winner I'm talking about is Karch Girali. A very good morning to you and it is a great pleasure to welcome you here to this seventh Aspire Fellows Summit and uh, I talked there about born winners you are exactly that a born winner as an athlete a born winner as a coach was that just something that was in you instilled in you you had to work hard at where did it come from? Um, I will completely disagree with your contention and say, no, I'm not a born winner. I'm not a born great volleyball player or a good volleyball coach. It, uh, it's not something that comes in genes. It comes in um, something that's probably used far too often these days, but it's a hunger to learn, uh, a growth mindset, just like we're not even born with the ability to crawl or walk. We've got to acquire all those skills. And so I would never speak of anybody as a born this or a born that, but as somebody, I think it detracts from anyone's, uh, from the work that goes on behind the scenes, especially as I made the transition from player to coach, uh, you can see it across sports that when somebody has a lot of success on the field of play, on the pitch, on the court, uh, as a player, whether it's uh, especially in team sports, 
the norm is they make lousy coaches because uh, things they, they see things and have an understanding of the game intuitively that most people don't. And they can get really frustrated or impatient when other people don't see it or recognize it or make good decisions like they did. And so um, I, I recognize from the beginning that I'm swimming upstream and I have to approach this thing called coaching with a very different mindset and with a beginner's mentality. So the growth aspect, who who and what was part of that growth into your success? Let's agree that you've been successful, if not a born winner. So who was part of that growth? Oh, I think it started with my parents. They both pursued um, not only university degrees. Uh, my father came from Hungary, actually, and escaped in 1956 after the, the peaceful revolution there, where they uh, worked, the, the students especially, tried so hard to win the country's freedom back. And he had to uh, leave or probably not survive uh, as the Soviets sent in their tanks. And so he came to this country, uh, to America, and made a new life for himself. And um, worked really hard in college. That's where he met my mother, and they both ended up with uh, postgraduate degrees. And so education was a huge factor for both of them, really important. And they both taught me and modeled for me how important it is to be a lifelong learner. And lifelong learning you did in volleyball with your father as well, because you know, you actually partnered your father on the volleyball court, and the story I, I find particularly interesting, we were talking to Arsene Wenger, a legendary football manager, just a little bit earlier, about finding talent early and developing and giving youngsters a chance. You got to play at the age of 11 or something with your father uh, against other men, and that was you realising at a very, very early age that you could compete. What a sport! You can compete at the same level with grown men at the age of 11. Now that must have been a significant development in your own volleyball prowess, if you like. Uh, absolutely. Uh, in fact, you're giving me uh, goosebumps or uh, whatever you call it when you, <laughs> uh, our team laughs at me or at me or with me because I get those a lot. Just get excited about little things. That was uh, a great gift. We actually read in one of the larger sports magazines in the United States called Sports Illustrated. We read a rare article about volleyball and one of the all time great Americans was uh, a player named Larry Rundle. And it was just around Olympic time. And so they featured him and they said, you know, he was the youngest ever to play a tournament at 11 years old. And at that time, there were no age group tournaments. There were no, there was no junior uh, volleyball, no club volleyball of any sort. And so my dad and I decided, hey, you know what, that'd be kind of fun to, to tie his record. But I think the, the gift in playing in that tournament, and I remember it very clearly, uh, uh, in beach volleyball, there are, you play double elimination tournaments. So you keep playing until you've lost twice. And we lost the first one very close game and lost the second one and i had the time of my life because uh, you know it's so difficult for boys to grow up to be good men and for girls to grow up to be good women that's a long difficult process but on this one sliver of life um, this gift gave me the idea that i could already stand toe to toe with grown men at the age of 11, at least in this sliver of life called volleyball. And that was incredibly empowering to me um, and a great gift that my dad gave me as my first teammate and, and my first coach. And then the other great gift he gave me was four years later, we had been partners that whole time and somebody new asked me to play, somebody better than both of us. And I didn't know what to do. Um, I could have seen plenty of fathers saying, you know what, we need to stay together. I've taught you so much. Um, we need to continue on in this journey. But he said, you know what, you're already getting too good. You have to go play with this player. My dad basically uh, terminated his, himself off the team and made me 
uh, and encouraged me to go on and uh, see how far I could go. And so that was another huge gift he gave me. Let's forward wind quickly. You wanted to become a biochemist and volleyball was always there. And then the US national team came calling and that was it. So let's get you into a position now. You are now playing for the US national team with a coach at that standard. What did you start to learn about that level of uh, coaching in, in, in volleyball? You asked before about, uh, you know, how did I learn about learning? I certainly learned uh, a ton from both my parents, but also I got to play for some of the all-time great coaches in this sport, at least in our country of the United States. My high school coach, that is secondary school, I guess is how some people would say it, Rick Olmsted, and then in university at UCLA, a legendary coach, Al Skates, and then I got to, as you mentioned, try out for and join the USA team where another legendary coach, Doug Beal, was coaching along with uh, uh, some, some great assistants on his staff. And so um, we certainly didn't necessarily, um, uh, we, we were a very um, young group, very inexperienced, raw, but we could see glimpses of potential. And so he pushed us, Doug and um, Bill Neville and Tony Crabb, the three main members of that, of that staff, to do things that we never thought we were capable of doing. We stayed together all year round. We trained together about 11 and a half months out of the year. We had learned that we couldn't compete with the world's great teams by assembling an all-star team, training for two weeks and going to the Olympics or the world championships. And so we turned it into a full-time national team year-round program. And we had to go through lots of suffering. Not all of it did we like, but it's easy to look back and say we needed every bit of it. And so, so much to learn from Doug. And, uh, and then the next head coach for the next four years of my journey with the men's national team, Marv Dunphy, and I consider them both friends and, and great coaching mentors now. I'm really lucky as I made that transition from player to, co player to coach to have coaches like that that I could bounce ideas off of and, uh, and ask them about decisions and questions. So is this how you've managed a successful women's U.S. volleyball team to get a gold medal? Is it that same method where you have got them to do things that they never thought was possible? Um, you know, I think our equation, it starts with this idea that our best shot at doing historic things, winning gold medals, winning world championships, is to be the best team we possibly can be, to basically out-team uh, opponents across the net. Anybody who's played in a team sport for a while has been on such teams. They're the best experiences that you can recall, or you've played against such teams. They're pesky, they're feisty. If it's world football, you're, somebody on your team has the ball, and all of a sudden there's seven people around, and you can't figure out how that happened, and they're playing as hard as they can, and they're celebrating each other's successes. So it starts with this idea of being the best team possible. Uh, we also focus greatly on just good people, people of high character and integrity. I guess the New Zealand All Blacks would call it the no dickhead rule, the no knucklehead rule. And so we love the group that we have and lots of really high character people. And then finally, we want to be um, a place of learning. We don't want to be a place of being where we are now, but of becoming something better. And so we put that all together, and that got us far, but it wasn't enough. And, um, and so we had to, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, it, it was certainly a really important and great collaboration between our coaching staff and are uh, all the members, the, especially the core 23 members of our team, only 11, only 12 of which could travel to Tokyo. 
but we uh, we had some things happen and take place, some planned, some not, that encouraged ownership, accountability, democracy, trust, things like that amongst the team so that we could be that kind of team that everybody has this great memory of. I remember that team that I was on where everybody just seemed to care more about the team than themselves, more about others' successes. When nobody cares who gets the credit, there's incredible power in that. When you said there, just to go back about when you said it wasn't enough, I guess you're referring to the bronze medal, which is, which is an achievement in itself in, in the Rio games. So there was more to come. You knew it, you felt it, you all wanted it. Did the strategy change from there or was it more of the same, just harder, more focused? Or, you know, what I'm getting at is, does the strategy change depending on what you're going for? Uh, you're exactly right. Good question, and you caught that. First of all, we thought we were capable of winning. We weren't the only team. There were several teams capable of winning in Rio. We ended up losing only one match, uh, a very close match to Serbia. After we had beaten them in the preliminary rounds, lost to Serbia in the semifinals, it was a soul-crushing defeat, incredibly one of, the, one of the toughest defeats that any of us has had. Uh, but then we went on two years later in 2018 and finished fifth in the world championships and grossly underperformed. And that's really what uh, drove the point home that this idea of pursuing team, having great people and being a place of learning was not enough. And so that's where we all as a group decided we, we need to up the level of ownership accountability, democracy, um, trust, things like that. And so that's where it really stepped up. Uh, and it started early in 2020 as we were just, uh, everybody around the world was experiencing lockdowns. We thought, okay, how do we put that extra 12 months to best use? How do we sharpen our swords uh, better? And how do we develop this sense of um, of team amongst our 23 players. And so we had a, a number of Zoom meetings. A critical uh, element in that is we added a member to our staff. A, a, a lot of teams, uh, it's very common these days for teams to have a mental skills coach, uh, otherwise known as a mental performance coach or a sports psychologist, sports psychology. Uh, we decided to go a little, um, and, and this was actually our players driving this decision, uh, but we decided to go a little bit of an unorthodox route and added a, 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 basically a culture coach to our staff. Someone, her name's Sue Enquist, and she had great, great success as a softball player and softball coach herself. But the one of the advantages for her to join our staff was that most sports psychologists, most mental performance coaches don't have the experience of what it's like to be a head coach. It's really easy. I know I did plenty of it when I was a player. It's really easy to complain about the coach's decision on this, the coach's decision on that, um, and, and it fall into the, that trap. Some of those are legitimate complaints, some aren't. But um, when you have someone working with a team, often without the rest of our staff, uh, it was hugely helpful for both our team and for our staff to have somebody who had had the experience as a coach to say, you know what, think of it from their perspective. For example, um, our team believed it and we believed it a little too that some people maybe many people were focused on a certain role being a starter being on the court as the game began rather than being uh in waiting for their turn as we might call it a game changer or a firewoman and uh and so there were everybody in our program agreed there was a little too much focus on that and and so sue drove the point home with them she said look you all need to be you need to be chess pieces you need to be ready for your coaches to plug you in wherever you're needed and if they decide that you in in the up to eight matches you play in the olympics 
that they're going to plug you in differently every single match because that's what's called for from the opponent across the net. You need to be prepared to do that. And I think she could speak from that uh, with just much greater authority. Uh, and they had much greater trust in her because of her experience. So that would be an example of the huge advantage that we had in adding to what we thought was a really good culture, but something that put us over the hump and allowed us to play and to really accomplish what we wanted to, to out team our opponents as we face them across the net at the Olympics. I love the fact you've talked about a cultural influence there. Tim Cahill, uh, the former footballer uh, who's here now, and we just had a chat, uh, played in four World Cups, of course, with Australia. He mentioned that he took with him in his personal life his cultural background as a Maori in New Zealand and a family that all loved rugby league. But the, the factors that were instilled into those rugby league players is what he took on to the football pitch, which is very interesting that, that you bring the cultural side there in, into volleyball. As far as your team um, uh, makeup was concerned, no team, however successful, is, is happy all the time. <laughs> What's your, what are your secrets in, in team management, dealing with the superstars? I know you talked earlier about you, you went for certain characters, but everyone's different. There is a superstar. There might be somebody, as you touched on earlier, who you need to bring on as a fire player or whatever to keep them happy. What are your secrets to keeping that harmony? I don't know there are any great secrets, but what works for uh, and what worked for us, especially in this year of 2021, our most successful year, um, was this idea of ownership, democracy, accountability. And so what would be some examples? Uh, the team, again, regularly had Zoom meetings with our, cons our, our culture consultant coach, Sue. And um, uh, so, for example, we, they wanted more accountability in our culture, in our program, and so did we coaches. Uh, that's one thing for coaches to remember is whatever you're getting now, um, you're perfectly designed to get that. And so something has to change if you want something different, if you want more of X behavior and less of Y behavior. Uh, unless you change something significant, you're going to continue to get what you're already getting. You're perfectly designed to, wait, uh, to get what you're getting today. But so if all of us want accountability, but we want to do, be in it together, uh, here would be an example. Early, we knew that uh, because our players, I told you how I when I played, it was a year round training program. Now, national teams work much more, let's say, as in uh, world football, where uh, players spend the vast majority of their time or a significant part of their time with their professional teams. And then they have uh, the summer season or the summer and fall season for national team play. And so early this year, we knew the transition between one and the other, getting our team back together, we'd only have a few days in some cases before we would have to depart for a 36 day long competition called Volleyball Nations League that would happen in a bubble in Italy. And so we had to take care of a lot of the homework along the way, refreshing concepts, uh, how we play uh, tactically, uh, lots of other things. And so we had a series, basically we did weekly homework uh, starting as soon as the new year began la this last January. And so then we, th from an accountability standpoint, uh, we would give them about a five minute video on a topic and say, okay, you have five days to, uh, by this day and this time, to file your homework, your answers to the questions posed uh, after watching the five minute to six minute video. Uh, so what happens if you miss that deadline? Well, we asked our, uh, our team and our, our leadership council, uh, help us, uh, what are the consequences? And so they said, we'd be glad to take that over. And so uh, when there was, when somebody missed something, fell short, a transgression or missed a homework deadline, uh, it just made things a lot more unified because we coaches would say, okay, she missed this and this, let us know how you want to handle that. 
and the uh, and the leadership council would let us know. I guess another example from a democratic standpoint is uh, when our team wanted to make decisions or we asked them for help with decisions, the first decision they had to go through was, okay, we're 23 people. How many of us need to favor a decision before it becomes something that we adopt? And so they went through a whole democratic process on that to arrive at, okay, we need 60% of the group that's the line, and if we're below that, then we don't have agreement on any particular topic that's discussed. But if we have 60% or more, we do. So those would be a couple of examples of how we uh, upped the level of democracy, ownership, and accountability in what was already a good group but needed more, as you pointed out. That's in the preparation, and, and that is meticulous, and, and it's very, very interesting. Come the event there has to be immediate crisis management. How do you go about that? Well, we do it if you, um, first of all, it's not going, it's not something where we've never, I've never believed this, that um, playing at a really high level, performing at a high level is a switch that we can just turn on and off. We have to be able to do it regularly in training, in other competitions, and not just expect that something's going to happen and will peak. And so when it comes to crisis management, it's the same concept. So we've had plenty of experience at that. I don't know. It, it might be um, a 45-hour trip from China to Argentina involving three or four flights uh, and having to play a few days later. How do we as a staff and how does the team as a group handle that if we staff or if i as coach model panic that's what i'm going to get uh, you know there's so many studies that show that it's really easy to infect people around us in just a few thousands of a second with whatever we're displaying as as an emotion or a response and so if we respond uh, with evenness with poise and with uh, constantly talking about expecting things, we're always gonna have a plan A and we're almost never gonna be able to execute that plan A because things are gonna come up and force us and the opponent, ha the enemy has a huge say in that equation too. But especially with COVID and lockdowns, we just have to be prepared for anything, absolutely anything. Here's something that surprised us. We would have loved to have had this information before we got on the plane to Tokyo, but we only learned after. What we learned uh, is that Japanese government regulations stated that, uh, let's say there's a typical row of seven across. Uh, as you land at the airport, uh, everybody needed to test immediately before either people involved in the Olympics went on to the Olympic Village or whether non-Olympic people, civilians just went on to their next flight or entered the country of Japan. So um, if somebody tested positive, everybody in that row and the two rows behind and the two rows in front were considered tainted by contact tracing. Um, and so that's something we didn't know. And we had a coach get caught up in that web of contact tracing. And so we had to figure out a way to work basically with her locked in her room 22 hours a day for the next 14 days. We lost, uh, that is, a key coaching member of our staff in her normal capacities. But we had talked about that so much and done so much pre-planning, both as a staff and as a team, that we were prepared for. That was something that we do regularly and did to a whole new level this year with COVID. And that was what we call what's called a pre-mortem, looking at an event, pretending hypothetically that it went very wrong, uh, that it, the wheels fell off the bus and we came far short of what we wanted to accomplish. What are all the possible reasons why that could happen? And so uh, it becomes a fun exercise in planning because A, 
you just madly list down what are all the things that go, could go wrong. We had our athletes do it. That was one of their weekly homework assignments. They gave us some new ones. They were really uh, helpful in helping us plan. And then we came up with a plan A to avoid any of those things that could go wrong and B, if they still went wrong, how to actually mitigate and manage it. And so those would be examples of uh, a ton of work going in so that it wasn't just flipping a switch when things actually went wrong as we knew they would at some point, many points during Tokyo. Uh, Couch, we've just got a couple of minutes left and please forgive me for, 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 for putting you under pressure with time here because what I want to just finish off with because it is a remarkable story and it takes what you've just talked about to the next level, remaining that calm, that poise, you as the coach. And it is out there, so I hope you don't mind me mentioning it. But, you, you know, you were diagnosed with, with cancer in 2017. Uh, you did not let on to anyone in your team of that condition, even right through the Olympics. Well, actually, it's a little different than that. Um, but uh, that's nice of you to bring up. In 2017... Uh, I had colon cancer. I told our staff about it, but I explicitly said, look, I don't want to worry our players about this. What I want to do is get, uh, and I had a mild form of chemotherapy, uh, just an oral uh, pill that I took uh, maybe two weeks on, then two weeks off. And it was over a six month period. And so what I wanted to do was first play a competition without our team knowing about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, with our staff knowing about it so I could show them that I could be exactly the same for them. I could bring the same energy level, the same focus, the same everything. At that point, at, at some point, I knew they might find out, and I'd rather them find out from me than from others. And so I did inform the team after we played that competition. I was happy that they were surprised, stunned. They knew nothing was going on. And they were very supportive, and so it, it, it drew us a little closer together. But I did not want to make a big issue out of it. I didn't want the focus to be on me. And so beyond the team and, uh, and coaching staff and my family, of course, just never really talked about that. And then it came out again during the Olympics. And, um, and so maybe I would change my opinion a little on that. I didn't think it was important to make a big deal about it. I didn't wanna draw attention away from our players and our team and what they were doing. I don't want the attention on me. And so, but the, the positive is I've actually had oh, over 20 people reach out to me and say, you know what, I heard your story. Uh, I'm far beyond the 45, uh, I think it's now 45 is the age at which people are encouraged to begin um, screening for colon cancer. I'm far beyond that. I've been lax on that. I'm going to go in and get my test. So there is a benefit to, that I missed in just not wanting to highlight that. Well, it's been a pleasure having you uh, as part of the Aspire Academy uh, fellows uh, today and people in, who've been linked in all over the world are extremely grateful to you for your time and you may i'll correct myself you may not be then the born winner but there's definitely <laughs> winning in the blood that's going through your veins at the moment Kaj Karali, thank you very much thank you so much it's been an honor to join and good luck to everybody out there fantastic thank you sir thank you uh Walter Di Salvo Voila. you're back lovely to see you to, to close the summit Thank you what, so uh, much for your oh, support. It was a hard work today, yeah? No, it was incredible. It's yes. just fantastic. We could yes. sit here for days. <laughs> we, we were lucky that you were here managing some issues because otherwise we were dead. Yeah. So. It's, it's a pleasure. It's so. an absolute pleasure. So I'll let you close the summit. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. We appreciate your support. Thank you. And, Thank you. Uh, let's say we say we are just arrived at the end of this long day. Uh, I think that I'm so sorry for some technical issues. Really sorry for Andrea Pirlo that had some problem of connection. Uh, as well, that uh, we'll collect is uh, an interview with him, and I will share with all of you in our uh, web. So don't worry, uh, we will have it from uh, from him is inside. But let's say now, I would like to say a lots of words around about this uh, this day. A lot of interesting thing because uh, I think that today 
we wrote an important page in terms of concept, not only in terms of content. The concept is that we are looking for something else. We want, we want really to enhance the player performance. We want to be better. We want to keep going learning. And we have to look for something else. We have to remove the barrier in football and see and learn from others. Lots of sports, athletics, basket, you, you, you know how, how, how the thing that they can give us, their inside is really huge. And we have to open this door. The next, I think that the next will be this one. The next for our fellows community will be to find a way to learn even more. Uh, some messages. First of all, uh, first of all, I would like to really thank you, uh, Mr. Sembenger, because he said that uh, he loved this this concept to share and to meet other sports. So thank you. But Mr. Sembenger, really, I want to thank you not only for being here today. Uh, we really appreciate. But I want to thank you, you and other coaches as Sir Alex Ferguson as well, for example, because you teach to all the coaches. To, you give them the courage to put the play young guys, 17, 18 years old, to put to play in your first team. And this is uh, the best example because this shows courage. It's easy to put a 28 years old guys, but it's not easy to put 17, 18, 19 years old guys. That guys will give you a lot because uh, you, you deserve giving the, the, the chance to show their talents, their capacity. So really, thank you. And I think that is uh, the words, not only my word, but is uh, thanks for many other people. Uh, on the how to manage the training, Barry told us something interesting. The talent, uh, looking first of all, the talent identification, this is one important thing. It's so important that with all of you fellows, as part fellows group, we did our first research on talent IT identification, and we published this article with a survey done with all of you. So this is a key aspect for all of us. And, uh, and uh, Barry remarked that he, this one, but he said as, as well, the environment. He spoke about the environment. Who build the environment? Who build the winning environment? Sometimes we ask to the player to be better, to win. But the first step is us. The winning environment starts from us, starts from the strength and condition for the physio, for the doctor, for the coaching, all that people build their winning mentality. So it's our suggestion of following what Barry said. Let's keep going building this environment because you cannot win a game if we don't have, you don't smell the winning attitude. Lorena talking about the recovery, she said that we have to think about, think about all the sleeping, the, 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 the nutrition, the, so the, yeah, the food, how, and, then, and then also how to manage the, the daily styling. So these three aspects, nutrition, recovery, and habits, uh, lifestyle, let's say, is really key. But not, it's not only key for recovery, better recovery, but it's key for a um, concept of injury prevention. And she spoke about the holistic concept of, of uh, prevention. Uh, I think that also in this area we have to do um, reflection, we have to think about, normally we are thinking that, uh, that injury prevention it, it, it introduce exercises of a core, uh, stability, whatever. But there are lots of uh, scientific evidence that show that that uh, exercise are not do not affect the number of injury. Of course, that we have to keep going doing that exercise. But the approach for uh, injury prevention should be another. From our point of view, we should care, as I said at the beginning, a running technique that is the key. That all the players run for 90 minutes plus and run well during, during the game, during the training, is a key moment for injury prevention. And then, uh, also the importance of, uh, of endurance. Uh, if we think that in the last World Cup, the most of the goal has been scored in the second half, and the higher number of injury happen at the end of the, the, the game, it means that in that moments, the fatigue 
can play an important role. And that, but in that moment that we win the game, where we score, when the team scores. So I think also mm, do not have a, mm, afraid to introduce, back to introduce uh, the important aerobic uh, work. And that doesn't mean I don't want to enter in uh, with ball or without a ball, it's up to you. But the, to understand that the player needs to arrive at the end of the, the game with a high level of, phys of physical level, good performance with a uh, clear idea to do a technical moments that maybe can let the team win, win a game. Ashton was talking about uh, the mental that the mental preparation is every day, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. We cannot think that uh, uh, just putting effort for a few days, for a period, no, it's not uh, as uh, the most of the people do, that when I arrive in March, every before the, to go to the beach, we try to do some exercise for, uh, okay, you know, an athlete is an athlete for 365 days. And this is really important. Also in the football, we have to learn a lot because during the summer, we cannot now, we cannot stop for one month because the pre-season is so short. So we have to educate our players to keep going, training themselves with individual plan. So they should follow the nutrition, they should follow this training program along the year. Now, each athlete should manage himself, should understand, we should to introduce the concept of awareness. In Aspire Academy, I have to say that we base everything on our awareness because only if the player know what he, he should improve, it, he, can, he can do it. Luis, he was talking about consistency, you know, is uh, the same concept. And then uh, be comfortable in the uncomfortable moments. Uh, what's, it's not easy, this is, a, is the challenge. Uh, maybe we can talk in this direction of uh, emotional control. You know, we do everything. We train the, our athletes under technical, tactical, physical performance. We do everything well. Let's imagine that we do everything well. but how we help them to control, to manage the emotions. Before the game, there are lots of emotions. In front of 80,000, or during the, the starting game of uh, Arab Cup, or in the final of, uh, of World Cup, can you imagine which kind of emotion the guys have, and they live internally? We should help them to manage them, the, to manage that emotion, and we believe that, for example, uh, do uh, introduce a deeper um, concept of breath exercise, respiration exercise will help them to explore another way to control this, uh, this emotion. Coach Kirali is, uh, is really the, the big coach, he's the only person that I could call coach. Uh, but just because uh, I think that is um, is considered a guru now, uh, whatever I do, we do well, we want to I think that uh, it is not easy uh, to be his, uh, his son because uh, yeah, the, there's his son. I have a father so so much uh, so much strong. So it's challenging also for them. He was talking. Uh, uh, he was talking about the, the concept that no one is born winner, and uh, this is an important concept. So he keep going saying the importance of learn. Keep going, always say, used to say, you have to improve yourself. But to improve yourself, you have to listen. A lot of time, when you speak with some people, the, you see that, the, the, also when you speak with the players, you see that they are thinking to something else. They are thinking to your answer, so to answer to yourself. But they are not focused on, on, on what you are telling them. So. First of all, teach them to listen, to improve, to enhance their awareness of their strong points, their weakness points, and then all in that way they can enhance and enhance their performance. As uh, we said at the beginning, you cannot beat the, the opponent if first you don't beat yourself. You have to compete against yourself each day if you want to improve. And this is, uh, uh, when you enter in this, in this approach, always you try to find a way to be, to be better. So, lots of words, I would like to be here with you for a long time. I know that is not possible, but uh, 
I want just to finalize. I'm so sorry because I know that at the beginning, uh, um, some of you didn't hear my presentation. I introduced also uh, 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 the restyling, uh, uh, the facelifting of our platform. And uh, now, one second, I want to show it this, uh, this restyling. see that uh, we try to push our athletes to do better, to keep going, improving, but uh, we do the same with ourselves. We keep going, investing energy, resource to be better. You see we are restyling that platform. The reason is because we really trust that, believe strongly that this program, Aspiring the World Fellows, is an amazing program. And it's a program that shows to the entire world, not only in football, but the entire world of sports, a way. The way is to keep going, sharing knowledge, experiences, and the way that uh, education processes are key to have a better people, to have a better athletes, better coaches. So this is, uh, is the reason because we are keep going, investing in the research, as I said before, the one research with talent identification, then a second research from youth to, to senior, how to reduce this gap. And then uh, we are thinking also with, with you, we, we, we ask you how is structure your youth academy to understand the, 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 the way uh, how performance and medical are managing their competencies. And all this research is done with you, we find a way to, to, to collaborate with the survey. We send you the survey, we collect your information, we share the result with you. A scientific committee write the article and we publish. Guys, what we are doing is really pure collaboration. And, uh, and the research comes from the needs, from the pitch come from our needs. What we need, we try to study together. So we show really the way to collaborate together, even if then maybe one day we are opponent and we try to beat each other. That's fine. But in this way, we are helping the world of football. We are helping the country that do not have the same opportunity, the same budget, that we have the same expertise. We are helping them to, to, to enhance their, their knowledge. And this is the reason because today we decide to open this community to also to the public who would like to extend. Of course, we will keep going, maintain this exclusivity, but we want to involve people in this. And then, now really, really, I don't want to spend uh, no much more words, but please, please, I need to have you here next year. So. Really, uh, I miss you. Uh, I know that uh, uh, with the technology, we can reach you in a virtual way, but we need to have you here. I'm missing a hug with, the, with you guys because uh, at the end, even the performance have a chemical factors. You cannot ask to a player to improve. You cannot ask to follow your, your indication in train methodology or whatever if you don't first create this content that is a chemical content. And during the last years, this, during these uh, seven years, uh, another great thing that we built is the connection relationship be between us. And this is the reason because I really hope that soon uh, the world came back to the normal, and normal is a beautiful world. 
and this is the reason because I would like to, to invite you for this summit. So here we are. Thank you, thank you, Rodri. Thank You're you, welcome. really appreciate it. Thank you, Daniele, and all the guys that works to make possible this meeting. See you in Doha, Doha 2022. <laughs> See you guys. See you. <laughs>